Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Korean Peninsula Peace Forum 2023. Uh, this is a, an event co-hosted by the Embassy of the Republic of Korea and the London Asia Pacific Centre of uh, SOAS and King's College. Uh, I'm Kat Yan Kong from the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS and the co-chair of the London Asia Pacific Centre. Uh, many thanks for attending on the busy Wednesday afternoon. Uh, this event is being recorded and streamed via Zoom, and the recording will then be posted onto YouTube. So, so don't be surprised if you, you know, your, your image or your voice ends up on YouTube. Um, so this forum uh, started as an initiative of the Korean Embassy in 2018, um, it's a regular event held at different venues by SOAS, Chatham House, Kings, with the generous support of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea. As the title states, the aim of this forum is to discuss the latest developments affecting the stability on the Korean Peninsula and to explore the potential paths towards peace. Uh, to discuss these, these issues and the deeper roots, we've we have distinguished panelists with experience from the worlds of academe, diplomacy, and policy analysis. And to introduce this event, we have two distinguished speakers. Um, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Yo Cho Yun, is the Republic of Korea's ambassador to the United Kingdom. He spent 39 years in the diplomatic service. Uh, before coming to the United Kingdom last year, he was the ambassador for international relations for Gwangju Metropolitan City in the southwestern part of Korea. Uh, for those who know Korea, you know that Gwangju has a very significant uh, place in the history of Korean democratization. Uh, prior to that, he served as Korea's ambassador to Egypt, and Ambassador Yoon has held other important posts, including the chief of presidential protocol, um, Deputy Minister of Protocol and Special Assistant to United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, a role which he served for eight years. And our other distinguished keynote speaker is Professor Joanna Newman. Uh, Professor Newman is the Provost and Deputy Director of SOAS prior to joining SOAS this year. Um, she spent six years as the General Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, uh, the, the first female uh, Secretary General of the ACU. Prior to joining the ACU, uh, Professor Newman was the Vice Principal International at King's College London. Uh, alongside her senior managerial roles, she remains academically active as a senior research fellow in history at King's. Her most recent publication is Nearly the New World, the British West Indies and the flight from Nazism 1933 to 45. In 2014, uh, Professor Newman was awarded an MBE in recognition of her work in promoting British higher education internationally. So please give a, uh, a warm welcome for our distinguished keynote speakers. Okay, um, Provost uh, Professor Joanna Newman, MBE, <laughs> and uh, Professor Tatian Kong, uh, Professor, uh, you insisted Mr., but uh, Pro Professor uh, Aidan uh, Foster Carter, um, Ambassador uh, Jim Hall, and uh, Professor Chris Hughes, and distinguished uh, scholars and students at SOAS, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Korean Peninsula Peace Forum, an annual event uh, hosted by the Korean Embassy in London in collaboration with the London Asia Pacific Center for Social Science. Please let me begin by thanking all of you for kindly attending today's forum. The Korean Peninsula Peace Forum has consistently been a valuable platform through which uh, the most eminent and experienced uh, scholars in the field of inter-Korean relations gather to offer their uh, valuable ex expertise in order to achieve greater peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to SOAS University London for jointly hosting this year's forum with King's College London. Personally, I find it very meaningful that this year's forum is being held at a time 
when there is such important issues uh, regarding the situation on the Korean Peninsula. The first point I would like to make is that the international community's interest in the human rights situation in North Korea is stronger than ever. Recently, more than 600 defectors were repatriated to North Korea against their will by the Chinese authorities, and we unfortunately still see many human rights abuse cases in North Korea. Some North Koreans have been publicly executed um, simply for disputing South Korean dramas uh, to other um, North Koreans, and forced abortions have been performed on pregnant women because they had been uh, repatriated. Even 10 years on from the landmark report released in 2014 by the Commission of Inquiry, COI, on human rights in the DPRK, the human rights situation in North Korea has not improved at all. We can still see that systematic, widespread, and gross human rights violations are being committed by the DPRK, and we have a very long way to go when it comes to human rights in North Korea. Aspiring to make Korea a global pivotal state, or GPS in short, the Korean government led by my president, Yoon suk yeol is striving to actively contribute to the promotion of universal values such as freedom, democracy, and human rights. We can no longer sit idle and watch what, what is happening in North Korea. Since its inauguration, my government has been implementing a wide range of policies to improve the human rights situation in North Korea. For example, we appointed uh, an ambassador for international cooperation on uh, North Korean uh, human rights, a position that had been vacant for five years despite the legislation that required the government to do so. And we reactivated the North Korean Human Rights Policy Council. And the first ever North Korean Human Rights Report was released this year by the Korean government. Moreover, we should not forget that the abysmal human rights situation in North Korea is closely related to the advancement of North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities. North Korea continues to squander its scarce resources on developing its weapon of mass destruction programs at the expense of uh, its own people. It has launched record numbers of missiles and so-called satellites while its people are starving and suffering from repression. North Korean workers overseas make earnings which are only to be exploited by the regime to finance its nuclear and missile program. The workers themselves face grueling working conditions with no holidays and minimal compensation. If the tens of millions of dollars squandered on every missile launched uh, had it instead been spent on improving people's lives, it would have substance, substantially uh, eased their hardship. The second point I would like to highlight is the importance of cooperation uh, among like-minded countries to tackle North Korea's WMD programs. While the whole world knows that a seventh nuclear test may take place at any moment, North Korea's WMD program developments and uh, ongoing missile launches uh, continue to pose significant threats uh, to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula, the Indo-Pacific, and beyond. However, due to the Ukraine war and geopolitical tensions between the United States and China, it has become difficult to tackle North Korea's violations of UN Security Council resolutions properly. Moreover, North Korea is taking advantage of this situation as we have seen uh, through its recent military cooperation with Russia. North Korea's WMD program development and uh, uh, con continuous missile launches constitute clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. If North Korea is allowed to avoid sanctions and raise illegal funds for its WMD programs, the threat will never be addressed. We sternly warn that all forms of arms trade and related cooperation with North Korea 
also directly infringe um, multiple Security Council resolutions, and that any attempts to assist North Korea's unlawful programs or to engage in arms trade with North Korea must stop. So this is where we need all our uh, allies uh, and like-minded partners. My government's audacious initiative, or AI, uh, focuses on uh, fostering a strategic environment where North Korea is dissuaded uh, from developing uh, WMD programs by depriving it of its various sources of illicit revenue, including cryptocurrency. We have already imposed our own sanctions on uh, the North Korean regime, but this is not enough. Tighter cooperation is needed to ensure that North Korea shall not be able to raise funds and realize that there is no point in its efforts uh, to develop WMD programs. The historic Camp David Trilateral Summit last August is a good example of the benefits of cooperation. President Yoon announced with President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida the establishment of a new trilateral working group to drive cooperation to combat North Korea's cyber threats and block its cyber-enabled uh, sanction uh, e evasion. At the same time, I wish to mention the UK government's close uh, cooperation uh, with Korea. The UK has always been a most reliable partner in dealing with uh, North Korea. The UK government has not hesitated to release statements condemning North Korea's recent ballistic missile tests and reaffirming UK's commitment to sanctions targeting the DPRK's unlawful weapons development program. As Korea is going to join the United Nations uh, Security Council as non-permanent member uh, from next year, the cooperation and coordination between our two nations will be further enhanced. Given the strong foundation of shared values, which has been confirmed by the invitation from His Majesty King Charles III for President Yoon to make a state visit to the United Kingdom, the first one after his coronation in May. To conclude, I would like to thank you all uh, for kindly attending and participating in uh, today's forum. Yes, the Republic of Korea is the main stakeholder in this process, but we will also need the kind support of the UK and other like-minded nations to create the genuine, sustainable peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. I look forward to fruitful discussions uh, pointing to specific ideas and effective measures that bring us closer to realizing our aspiration. Thank you. 감사합니다. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for, for giving us such a wonderful introduction to uh, this symposium. Dear friends, colleagues, Your Excellency, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be opening this event. Um, and before moving on to the details of the forum for today, I want to briefly outline uh, SOAS's historical interest in the Korean Peninsula and its centrality to our intellectual mission. Our mandate, as uh, it, it is clear in our, in our plan, uh, it's to interrogate and understand the global challenges of our time through the perspective of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. In other words, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East aren't areas of study at SOAS, but rather the prism through which we study and understand the world. And so the purpose of the forum is not to study the Korean Peninsula, uh, but to provide a platform for the perspective of the Korean Peninsula in addressing the challenges of our time. The Korean Peninsula Peace Forum uniquely brings together leading authorities from the academic and practitioner communities in the UK and Europe to discuss the sources of tension uh, on the Korean Peninsula and explore the pathways to the easing of tension and the establishment of permanent peace. We have historically had a diverse audience ranging from students, academics, practitioners from the worlds of diplomacy, advocacy and business, as well as members of the public with an interest in the Korean Peninsula. These events rotate between my, my old uh, University, King's College London, and SOAS, 
the first forum was held here at SOAS in 2018, then at King's in 2021, where our director, Adam Habib, who gives his very best wishes to this forum, uh, gave a keynote speech in 2022. And so we're delighted to be hosting it here again at SOAS this year. Um, on the structure and themes of the forum, this year's uh, will focus on two themes uh, relating to recent developments. First, it will discuss the strategy of the Republic of Korea under the current um, administration. In its dealings with North Korea, the Yoon administration has strongly emphasised the simultaneous promotion of human rights and denuclearization. This represents a departure from the previous administration, which envisaged the improvement of human rights as the culmination of a long process of engagement, economic cooperation and peace building, including denuclearization. It brings us back to the perennial issue of how best to influence North Korea for the better by engagement to the previous administration or by stronger deterrence with political pressure, the current administration. Second, the forum will turn to the broader international context and assess the implications of the recent diplomatic developments for security and cooperation. It will focus on the results of the recent uh, ROK US Japan summit, which was held in August 23, that heralds much closer military cooperation between the three countries. A sign of that closer cooperation is the official visit of nuclear missile armed US submarines. Uh, 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 to uh, the Republic of Korea and the Yoon administration's efforts to improve diplomatic relations with Japan that were strained by long-term historical disputes. The forum will consider the likelihood of closer military cooperation between the Republic of Korea and Japan, considering historical difficulties, and it will also consider whether this uh, mini-lateralism represents the emergence of a new Cold War in Northeast Asia. The recent DPRK Russia summit uh, held in September 23 has been interpreted as the beginning of such a trend. So I wish you all the very best in your deliberations for what sounds like an absolutely fascinating day. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend. I also want to thank uh, deeply the Korean Embassy for working with us in bringing together this forum and to King's for co-hosting it with us. Thank you very much.
national security program, so. Does, it, does this work? Oh. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So, um, so our first session, the the theme of our first session, is the uh, inseparable connection between North Korean nuclear issue and North Korean human rights. Um, that was something that was emphasised by the uh, ambassadors in the ambassador's speech. Um, the the current uh, uh, ROK, Republic of Korea Administration of President Yoon Sok Yol, has emphasized the simultaneous promotion of human rights and denuclearization. Uh, the previous administration envisaged the improvement of human rights as the culmination of a longer process uh, cooperation, engagement, uh, peace building. The, the promotion of human rights, a stronger emphasis on human rights alongside denuclearization actually also has advocates, especially in the United States, uh, amongst diplomats who, um, who previously dealt with North, North Korea. Uh, their view is that after 30 years of nuclear diplomacy with North Korea, uh, no denuclearization has actually been achieved. So for example, uh, Joseph uh, Tetrani, a former special envoy, to the six-party denuclearization talks uh, is one of, an example of an um, American diplomat in the American diplomatic community putting more emphasis on uh, using human, human rights in order to pressure the North Korean regime. Uh, this has echoes of the Reagan administration in the United States placing greater emphasis on human rights promotion in the 1980s, following the disappointments of detente with the Soviet Union. To discuss these issues, we're joined by two excellent panelists. Uh, on my left uh, is Dr. Marion Mesmer, a senior research fellow in the International Security Program at Chatham House. She works on arms control, nuclear weapons, policy issues, and Russia-NATO relations. Uh, before joining Chatham House, Marion was a co-director of the British American Security Information Council, where she led the organization's nuclear risk reduction and disarmament work. Uh, Marion is a N2 Innovation Fellow, and also she was um, a fellow of the Arms Control Negotiation Academy. She holds a PhD in security studies from King's College. And uh, my, um, to my right is uh, Dr. James Hall, Jim Hall. Uh, he has a PhD in Japanese history from the University of London um, and was from SOAS, from SOAS, in fact. Um, and uh, for University of London, in, in, those, in those days, I think, you know, they, they didn't distinguish so sharply between colleges. Um, he was a research analyst in the British Diplomatic Service and uh, the head of the North Asia Research Section at the Foreign, Foreign Office. Um, he served in Seoul and Beijing and was Britain's first representative in Pyongyang. Uh, since retirement, he's taught at SOAS from time to time, uh, establishing a course on North Korea, which he ran for five years. He's also an honorary research associate uh, in the Center of Korean Studies of SOAS. Um, he, he's written widely on East Asia, uh, most recently, the historical dictionaries on the people, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, his selected writings on Asia uh, for Amsterdam University Press uh, is in is in press. So, uh, you know, when when they do your when somebody publishes your selected writings, I think it, it means you you know you you've got some kind of uh, some kind of status. <laughs> means you've or you finally retired. Um, in 2021, he received the, the Udang Prize from the Udang Foundation uh, for Education and Culture in the Republic of Korea. Um, so please uh, g give a warm welcome for our two panelists. 
So I shall begin with Marion. Marion will talk for about 10 minutes, then Jim will talk for about 10 minutes, then we will have questions and answers. So Marion, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to SOAS for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we, we already heard in the keynote speeches some of the challenges that um, is essentially going to face the, um, the South Korean government's attempts at um, pushing ahead with making progress on denuclearization. We already heard that this is something that has been attempted again and again for decades. And um, given the wider tensions in the international security environment, which also means that many of the partners that um, the Republic of Korea will need to engage in order to make progress on this um, are under a lot of other pressures, it, it means that it's ba basically going to be very difficult and um, and take a lot of effort. So what I wanted to do in my remarks is essentially um, map out a few of the challenges that are going to stand in the way of making progress on denuclearization, um, wherever possible, point out how progress could be made, um, and also talk a little bit about what some of the, um, what some of the shifting alliances and allegiances between North Korea and, uh, and other countries um, might mean for this progress. So um, there, there's essentially a lot that has, um, that has changed for, it's probably fair to say, the worst in the last few years, um, not just in terms of the wider security environment, but also um, the situation on the Korean Peninsula, um, which is also going to be part of what's going to make it more difficult. So I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves when we talk about denuclearization is um, why North Korea wanted to acquire nuclear weapons in the first place and what their impetus is for continuing to develop, uh, to, to develop and invest in both their missile program and their nuclear program because that is intrinsically linked with what's going to stand in the way of them agreeing to give up their nuclear weapons. So um, we know that the regime sees nuclear weapons and um, especially its intercontinental ball ballistic missile capabilities um, as the ultimate grantor of the regime. Um, they, they are very worried about the possibility of regime change. Um, and so they invest further in their nuclear capabilities, um, making the assumption that that is going to prevent predominantly the United States, um, but also the Republic of Korea, uh, from doing anything that could lead to regime change. So um, the, the second assumption that goes along with that is that over time, um, North Korea is going to be accepted as a nuclear power because other states essentially don't have um, any other opportunity or any other um, possibility other than to accept the reality of nuclear weapons in North Korea and um, the, the power that that confers on the regime. So that's the, that's the fundamental challenge. Um, so what does that mean for denuclearization? It means that in order to agree to denuclearization, um, I think the North Korean um, regime will have to believe that there are credible security guarantees in place that mean that it will be able to continue on uh, without nuclear weapons. And, um, and that essentially is more and more difficult, the more hostile the, the diplomatic environment is overall. Um, we've seen that the nuclear program has grown and expanded quite significantly over the last few years. Um, we, we heard from our keynote speakers that we can expect another nuclear test soon. Um, we, uh, we've been trying to track any movements towards that. Um, so uh, I don't know any more than the rest of you, I, I suppose, as to when that might be. But um, it is unfortunately something that seems to be on the cards. Uh, we have seen throughout 2022 that a lot of different missile uh, types have been tested. And um, there has been an astonishing number of um, nearly 70 missile tests throughout the year, uh, which was a huge ramping up to what we had previously seen. And um, during those tests, we've also seen new missile capabilities that we hadn't previously seen, which also suggests that actually, um, you know, the, um, the strategic significance of nuclear weapons is changing for the North Korean government away from uh, just providing protection for the regime to potentially also 
being usable in conflict or um, you know, being, being something that plays a more active deterrence role. So essentially it seems as if um, the North Korean regime is trying to expand its capabilities to have robust second strike capabilities, which plays a really important role in being able to assure deterrence, um, while also actually investing in um, shorter range and lower yield nuclear weapons, which could also be used in a battlefield scenario. So um, that's a shift from, I suppose, the last, uh, the last decade or so, where we have seen essentially um, them just trying to acquire nuclear capabilities in the first place, trying to make sure that the, the missile <coughs> capabilities that they have were actually operational um, towards a nuclear program that could become slightly more sophisticated and slightly more established. Um, something else that that means for the region is that nuclear risks actually increase quite significantly. Um, and um, what we have also seen in line with that is that the North Korean People's Assembly adopted a new law in September 2022, which changed the circumstances under which North Korea would consider using nuclear weapons first. Um, so previously, North Korea had considered nuclear weapons um, as a deterrence capability, so they were considering using them um, if they were under attack. But the, the um, legislative change in September 2022 expanded that declaratory policy to also include um, a first launch if there were any concerns about the uh, viability of the North, the North Korean regime. So that's, um, that's not necessarily unheard of when it comes to nuclear possessor states. Um, the Russian government has a very similar clause, but it does increase nuclear risks, especially if you are in situations of conflict. And um, of course, especially for an autocracy, it's very subjective whether the um, regime survivability is assured or not. So it essentially, um, it, it provides a very difficult and risky sort of um, justification for using nuclear weapons, um, which of course plays into the, the overall assessment of um, North Korea wanting to be seen as invincible um, and basically wanting to use nuclear weapons for deterrence purposes. So um, I think for denuclearization, that essentially means that it's going to be very difficult because um, if that is how the North Korean regime assesses its security environment, right, a very hostile security environment where you need to expand your nuclear arsenal in order to assure your protection, um, where you need to expand your declaratory policy principles in order to make sure that your um, regime can survive, then that makes it very unlikely that you would agree to any negotiations about uh, nuclear capabilities. Um, and uh, the other aspect that I think has significantly changed for the worse, um, especially since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is that um, the geopolitical um, relationships have changed for the worse. So, for example, in 2017, we had a really unique situation in the UN Security Council insofar as that um, uh, the Permanent Five were able to agree on a joint resolution when it came to North Korea. Um, normally, both China and Russia can be spoilers in that regard. But I think especially after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the Russian government's attempts to strengthen alliances wherever it can, and also the, the strength and cooperation that we have seen between Russia and North Korea, I would, um, I would find it pretty um, implausible that the Russian government would agree to any additional pressure on North Korea. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the Russian government helped the, the North Korean government to evade any sanctions or um, get around any additional pressure. Um, the relationship with China is similarly complicated. Um, and especially at the moment where China is trying to sort of um, play a careful balance between its support for Russia and, um, and its own role as a growing nuclear power, um, it seems unlikely that China would support additional pressure on North Korea as well. Um, and then if we talk about this attempt to link addressing human rights and denuclearization, um, I think one aspect where it could become pretty tricky is when we think about uh, the, this clause about regime survival. So, um, so, 
you know, I think that the North Korean regime is really unlikely to engage with anything that could undermine its regime stability. And um, we know that historically it has seen both attempts to address human rights and attempts to address denuclearization as, um, as potential destabilizing factors. So in that regard, um, there is a clear similarity between the issues insofar as that the North Korean regime really does not like to talk about them or address them. And um, I don't think that is going to go against its policy preferences in that regard. Um, what, something we have already seen in past diplomatic attempts is that North Korea might insist on stopping any discussion of human rights um, if it was to make progress on denuclearization. So we might end up in a tricky situation where actually insisting on progress on one issue might make progress on the other issue more difficult, which then leaves states um, and especially the Republic of Korea with a really difficult assessment of how to prioritize um, those two really important priorities and uh, how to play a strategy where it can hopefully make progress on both. Um, so I think I will leave it at that and hopefully that has given some food for thought for discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Marion. Uh, a lot of interesting points there. And I will move on to Jim now for your perspectives. Jim? Is it on? No. Yes, it's on. It's on. Um, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm not quite sure I'm the right person to be talking on this subject. Um, it's never stopped me before, of course, but uh, that's a different matter. Um, I worked both in Seoul and in, in Pyongyang. Um, I have much liking for the Korean peoples, North and South. I like to think I have some understanding of them, North and South. What I think one should start off with is that abandoning any view that North Korea is somehow unique in the world. North Korea is a very isolated country. It is a very tough and in many ways unpleasant regime, but it is not unique in, in either of those characteristics. And it's not unique over human rights abuses. There are many other countries that uh, uh, engage in human rights abuses, uh, including our country, Britain, including the United States, and indeed in the past, certainly, and I wouldn't uh, profess to know about the present, in the Republic of Korea as well. Um, I still remember being sent by my ambassador in place of him to a meeting where the decision by President Chun Doo-hwan to establish what amounted essentially to concentration camps for delinquents, beggars, such like people, was announced by the foreign ministry to the consternation of most of the diplomats present. But that's in the past. Um, linking human rights with other issues, I think, is fraught with a lot of danger. Um, it is absolutely true that if North Korea were to abandon its nuclear weapons, it might have funds and the means of um, buying food to replace its own lack of food. If Britain gave up nuclear weapons, we too could make a big difference to the poverty that now appears to exist in our country. If the United States did, they could make an even greater difference to their country. Um, but I, I think that with the Yun government's decision to emphasize human rights in the context of denuclearization, that you end up with the inability to make progress on either front. I believe strongly that the way to deal with North Korea is to abandon the policy of isolating it, but to engage it. Now, that is not the policy of the current government in, in the ROK. It has been the policy of most governments in the past, even if 
the degree of engagement was always perhaps limited, but the idea was that here we are, we are Koreans, we are, occupy the same peninsula, we have to work together. And to abandon that would be a big mistake. I think it's always a mistake just to criticize. It puts the North Koreans or anybody else in such a position on the back foot. They will be defend, defending themselves, defending their position. And I think, to be honest, the overemphasis on the use of sanctions in the case of North Korea ha has, to my mind, been a complete failure. Younger people may not realize that North Korea has been under sanctions of one sort and another, bilateral sanctions, but from the United States, since July 1950. Those, the sanctions regime has intensified in recent years in attempts to get North Korea to denuclearize. But North Korea has managed to evade those sanctions. There are plenty of people in the world both governments and organizations that, if they can make a quick buck, will do so. The reason North Korea has um, 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 oh gosh, what are they called? The hovercraft, sorry. Um, hovercraft is a, a British company was willing to broker the sale of such, such equipment, banned under um, arms control um, rules to North Korea. Chinese vessels call at North Korean ports, Russian vessels call at North Korean ports. Ships anchor off North Korea and North Korean vessels come out to them. There's a whole international system of sanctions evasion. Even when I was in Pyongyang, we were even shown um, overcoats being made for so sale through Sears and Roebuck in America. They didn't have Pyongyang on the label, they had China on the label, and we were told there was another factory up the road that made the labels to put in these garments made in Pyongyang. Sanctions evasion, again. So, think away from sanctions for a bit. My own belief is engagement is the way forward with North Korea. Now, um, um, Tak Hong has mentioned the uh, US report that uh, Joe Tra D D Trani was one of the con contributors to it. And that, um, I read it with great interest, but as soon as I got to the end and saw that the advisors included a certain John Bolton and Victor Char, I thought, oh well, yes. Um, both of them are very hawkish on, on the whole Korean issue. And uh, Bolton, you can say, is the man who could be most credited with the massacre of the agreed framework, the, the 1994 limitation on North Korea's nuclear program, which despite all the propaganda did actually work at the time, um, it limited or it stopped the development of North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons program at the time. It didn't end it because it, it was mothballed, but it did work. Bolton killed it. Once he, once, um, the George, uh, the George W. Bush administration came in. Bolton's philosophy was, I want to put a stake through the heart of the agreed framework. And he succeeded. So what happened? Instead of nu a, a nuclear cap being in place, it was removed, and the North Koreans continued then to develop what is now their current program. Much, much different than what it was when I went to Pyongyang in 2001. Similarly, the, I think that there was great hope at the time of the Trump summit. Now, 
I have not much time for Mr. Trump personally, but he had, at least on the North Korean issue, a certain amount of imagination, similar to what President Nixon had done towards China, perhaps, back in the 70s. An agreement could have been reached with, I think, minimal concessions to the North Koreans. The, according to the, 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 the story put out by some, including the same John Bolton, um, the North Koreans demanded the lifting of all sanctions. The North Koreans said they didn't demand the lifting of all sanctions. They wanted some evidence of sanction relief. But it was enough to break up the, the meeting and to end that opportunity. And that, of course, has sent the North Koreans onto a, a rather more, as outlined previously, a rather more determined track in developing their nuclear program. But I would still argue that the way to deal with North Korea is not to always be hostile towards them, to take any opportunity you have of broadening the minds of people in North Korea of showing them that there are alternative ways of doing things. Engagement, bringing people out of North Korea, whether those are officials or students or what have you. Show them the outside world, show them a different set of values, show them different things. Now, they go back, they go back into the same system, but minds are changed. One of the few things, if effective things that we did when I was in Pyongyang was to have two, um, some of you may have heard this story before, we had two people come to London from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to take part in a program of human rights training ran by the University of Essex. I thought they wouldn't come. Instead, the Foreign Ministry wanted to send 10, the two who came, which was all the foreign office was willing to support. The two who came were middle-ranking officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they came, and they were told that they would have to follow the course as set out, which included visits to Amnesty International, a dirty word in North Korea since a report in the 1990s, and they would have to visit other human rights-related organizations. They said they wouldn't do that, and they were told they had to, so they did. And they went back, and they didn't disappear into the camps, as some suspected might happen. They went to work, back to work in the foreign ministry. I met them both. One of them eventually came to London to work in the embassy in London. We also supplied a mass of textbooks on human rights, 200 volumes on human rights. Again, my thought was, well, they'll just disappear. But you know, for weeks and months afterwards, at various receptions, people I didn't know from the foreign ministry would come up to me and said, we read those books you gave us. They were very interesting. And of course it turned out that they were looking for uh, letouts, but they were still learning. The first thing they turned to was the record of the United States on human rights, which um, uh, was a tactical move perhaps, but they would have learned, and the same was true of students who came to study uh, various other f subjects in the UK. For a time, University of Warwick had courses in uh, um, business methods for, for North Korean students, arranged by Professor Hazel Smith. Other universities, um, there, was, there were some came to London for language training, some went to Cambridge for other forms of training. You broaden their minds, and that gets fed, fed back into the system. So I think that there is a danger in lumping all issues with North Korea together. Rather than distinguishing what you can do in one area, you may make advances if the North Koreans are feeling confident. I don't think that's going to be for a long time yet. But at times when they could see opportunities in the world, whether it was during the sunshine policy period of President Kim Dae-jung, or whether it was under Moon Jae-in, but 
always at the background was the concern about the United States. And I think the, um, the fear of United States power, which is an echo of the Korean War, but still kept alive um, by teaching in the schools and in the universities about the awfulness of that war. And it was an awful war. Um, with a country, a small country, pounded into the Stone Age by the admission of the American Air Force Commander-in-Chief, Curtis LeMay, by April 1951. And the bombing went on for two years more. So there is real fear, I think, implanted in the North Korean psyche of the power of the United States and what they do about it. They've seen, under the more conservative governments in the United States, a hostile approach, and so they have developed their nuclear program to counter that. For 30 years, they tried to engage with the United States, and I think with the failure of the Trump summit, they gave up. But that's no reason to not try again. Sorry, that's a bit rambling. Um, I... Uh, Get, uh, I'm grateful to be invited, but I'm not sure quite why I was asked to talk on this subject. But uh, I'm quite willing to try and answer questions afterwards. Thanks. So now I'd like to take questions, uh, but maybe to, to begin with, uh, just I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one for one for Ma Marion. Um, you know, regarding the North Korean build-up of its nuclear nuclear weapons program, its weapons of mass destruction, especially over the last couple of couple of years, you know, we see the the the, the in, uh, phenomenal increase in the number of tests of various types of systems. Um, how 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 much nuclear deterrence is enough for the North North Koreans? Um, because if we compare China at a parallel stage, maybe in the 1960s, 19, 1970s, the, the deterrence that they developed was actually relatively minimal. Whereas North Korea seems to be very ambitious on all, on all fronts, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of systems. And uh, to Jim, uh, there's a view that over the last 30 years, all kinds of concessions have been given to the North, to the North Koreans. Um, especially by various South Korean administrations, the the three liberal administrations we've had over the last 30 years, Kim Dae-jung, No Mu Hyun, uh, Moon Jae-in, Jae that they've actually they've actually tried very hard to engage with engage with North Korea, uh, but North Korea simply hasn't you know hasn't uh, hasn't recipro reciprocated. That the current strategy, some would argue. It, this is actually a, a response to the failures, the failures of the past. So those will be my questions. So Marion, Jim. Thank you. That's a, well, how much nuclear deterrence is enough for North Korea is a really good question and one that's actually really difficult to answer. Um, if you wanted, a, you know, the, the most accurate assessment of how North Korea is thinking about its deterrence capabilities at the moment, um, you would really need to speak with the people who do the, de the deterrence planning. Um, but um, I think how we can approach it in trying to understand <coughs> why the North Korean buildup is looking the way that it is, is by e essentially um, considering how North Korea might perceive its security environment. So we heard earlier that um, the United States is still in the back of uh, North Korean minds when it comes to thinking about who the adversary might be, where security threats might come from. Um, and, so, and so the important thing is to remember that uh, the, the nuclear deterrence capabilities that North Korea has built up are not necessarily aimed at South Korea, but they are aimed at the United States. And if you compare the US arsenal with the North Korean arsenal, then um, they you know, probably aren't going for parity, but they are probably going for um, a second strike capability that would allow them 
to deter a US first strike. So for, for those of you who maybe are not as familiar with nuclear deterrence principles, um, a, a very common principle for how you try to ensure that your nuclear deterrence works is by making sure that you have a second strike capability that would survive if you were to be attacked with nuclear weapons. So that means that you try to have um, intercontinental ballistic, ballistic missiles that are hard to find, um, that are sort of dispersed over territory, um, perhaps some that are submarine-based, some that are land-based, so that you can ensure that at least a certain number of them will survive. Um, and you will have those um, ICBMs targeted at your potential adversary, so that even if they launch a surprise attack, uh, you will be able to you know, essentially also uh, send nuclear weapons back. And the idea behind that is because no one wants to Yeah, I think that's better. Um, so I think the the, um, the the principle behind it is that uh, you will not be attacked because, of course, your adversary doesn't want to risk um, being at the receiving end of your second strike. So when we saw the test of the um, new type of intercontinental ballistic missile um, in 2022, which... Um, which has solid fuel, which means that you know it's, it's it can be launched at much shorter notice um, and it's much easier to hide because you don't have like a complicated fueling process which would give away that you're getting ready for a strike. Um, that's what makes me think that this is really what they're working towards. Um, the development of the tactical nuclear weapons, I think, speaks to something else because tactical nuclear weapons. Um, are usually not part of a, a sort of strategic um, deterrence strategy. Uh, they are usually much more about um, being usable. Some uh, strategists also refer to them as tactical nuclear weapons or battlefield nuclear weapons. Um, I personally wouldn't agree that they're very usable in a battlefield scenario, but they are essentially used, um, I suppose, as, as another way of ensuring that perhaps um, a conventional war isn't started because there's always the risk that it's going to escalate to um, a nuclear level through that range. Um, but a lot of other larger nuclear powers, um, such as Russia, have a lot of tactical nuclear weapons, which might be why North Korea also found it important to invest in that capability. Um, but um, yeah, it is. I, I think the, the problem that we're facing with regards to the North Korean buildup is that North Korea is looking to the United States, which of course has the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Um, and if you are trying to have a you know survivable second strike capability with such a large adversary, then that's very tricky to achieve as a small nuclear power. I think the is that all? Is that all? Yeah. <coughs> I think that the 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 testing sort of is a reflection of those three areas, or sort of the long range. Yes, the United States, the shorter range ones, Japan possibly, um, and possibly South Korea, and that's why you have the, the different types of test. Um, it's to give you as as much capability as possible. Um, whether you could actually use a, a tactical nuclear weapon in a conflict on the Korean Peninsula without damaging your own side as much as the other, I doubt somehow. But um, engagement, why did it fail? Look, every president, apart from Syngman Rhee, has talked about engaging with North Korea. Um, Park Chung-hee engaged or the Park Chung-hee administration engaged in such talks in 1970-71. So they lasted, I think, till 73, so, um, when they were broken off. Even Chun Tu um engaged in uh, a form of... Although Chun Tu they tried to kill him in, in Rangoon and killed many of his, um, his ministers or some of his ministers and some of his officials, people I knew, um, died in Rangoon when, when, the North Korea, sorry, when the North Koreans tried to kill Chun Tae Wan. But within a few months, Chun Tae Wan was willing to accept North Korean offers of aid during heavy flooding in the South. In other words, he too wished to try and engage. Note Wu tried to engage, and so on and so on. 
trouble is, what is the engage? What was the offer of engagement? Now, you're right. There have been the, pro the so-called progressive presidents have gone much, much further, and they've also tried to, I think, particularly Kim Dae Jung, but also Moon Jae In, um, tried to indicate to North Korea that they were not threatening North Korea, that there was no question of a takeover, that there was no, that they were going to deal as country, a state to state, and which made a difference. But ultimately, South Korea for, is, is seen as part, for, in the North, is seen as part of a US um, complex. Um, now particularly reinforced by the Camp David meeting and Japan and North Korea agreeing with the United States to work together. Um, but uh, I remember, and I've quoted this many times before, I remember at a conference in Cambridge some years back, the uh, Korean academic, Sude Sok, talking about this very subject of engagement between North and South, and saying the problem is that each side puts forward proposals in the end that it knows the other side isn't going to accept. This is particularly true of unification, the, the, the great goal of the, uh, the supposed goal of the Korean people, that um, the North Koreans say unica unification the South wants unification under our great leader, whichever great leader it happens to be at the moment. The South sees itself as being the dominant partner in, the, in, in any unification. It is very difficult for either side to accept the others, and so they don't. So it goes on. But I think it's, uh, um, it is the only hope. But I think it needs acceptance by both sides, and I know this is very difficult, that there are two separate states on the Korean Peninsula. And that means full diplomatic recognition of each other. It means accepting that even if the goal, ultimate goal is one day the Korean people should be reunited, that day is not going to be to come quickly. It's a long way off. Personally, I think one day geography, history, culture, may help the peninsula to become unified again. But in the past, it's been broken up. Its unification lasted a long time. But then so did the German unification, if you think about the Holy Roman Empire and how, that, how long that lasted. A loose federation of the German peoples, perhaps, but it still lasted. And then it broke up. And German unification has never been completed subsequently, except briefly, between 1938 and 1945, when Austria was absorbed into the greater Germany. And that, that ended with the end of the Second World War. So although Korea has been united and may one day be united, there's no necessary guarantee that that reunification is, to, is going to come quickly. And... Um, I was uh, not surprised to see in the, again, this American paper uh, with uh, Tetrani and the others, that the goal at the end is unification under the, R the ROK. Uh, so that's not unification, that's absorption. And that, I think, is always going to mean that the other side will ultimately be very suspicious and break off engagement if it feels it's not getting anywhere. It's sad, but I think it's true. Uh, questions? Questions from the, questions from the floor. floor? Yes, a Saif. Thank you. 
given this kind of development and the escalation in development of nuclear weapons and long distance weapons. Uh, are you okay with this one, Sandra? Yeah, I can give it a go. Um, thanks for that question. So um, I. Uh, which one to take first? So I think one of the ways in which we can see the the immediate impact of the nuclear um, arsenal in North Korea is essentially what we saw, you know, come out of South Korea earlier in the year, right? Um, a huge expression of concern about the nuclear weapons that were present there, huge expression of concern about tensions in the region generally, also with China, and um, and essentially a request for additional support uh, from the United States and also a request for um, a strengthening of the, um, of the alliance relationship with the United States. So the US is currently trying to provide that by um, sending US nuclear armed submarines to the region um, more frequently. I think we've had at least two visits so far. Um, and, um, and that's of course, you know, part of the United States non-proliferation strategy because they want to avoid that there's further damage to the global non-proliferation regime by South Korea and or other states in the region also wanting to acquire nuclear weapons because they feel that it's in their security interest. So the, the big risk that a continued North Korean buildup poses, um, of course, is, is the risk of something going wrong, uh, but it's also the risk to the wider environment of, um, of nuclear stability that we've had quite successfully for several decades, um, which has unfortunately been weakening for a range of different factors, North Korea just being one of them, but the cumulative effect of these different impacts on it means that uh, the global non-proliferation regime is currently actually looking a lot weaker than it has done in the past. Um, what does that mean for diplomatic relations? Um, so what, one of the things that I think keeps coming up in that regard is North Korea's insistence that over time it will, has to be, it will have to be accepted as a nuclear power. It may not be wrong in that regard, you know, like we were sort of in a similar situation with India and Pakistan, who are not officially accepted as, as nuclear powers, but of course everyone knows that they're nuclear possessor states, which has a lot of implications for the region in terms of what kind of risk reduction dialogues you want to have in place, what kind of um, crisis hotlines you want to have in place. And so it is very well possible that we're going to get to a point where we have to engage in similar pragmatic conversations with North, North Korea simply because it's important for the stability of the region and to ensure that there isn't any further um, escalation or that any, you know, crisis escalation potential is contained as much as possible. Um, I think that is going to be a really big diplomatic hurdle because um, it's something that the US is not very likely to do and does not want to do, um, that South Korea does not really want to do. But um, I think that's going to essentially be a very pragmatic trade-off of how much good can we do through such engagement versus um, what's the longer term damage by essentially acknowledging that, yes, nuclear uh, weapons are in North Korea and they play a really big strategic role. Um, so if, if I, you know, if, if we sort of took that out of the equation, the, the acknowledgement of the North Korean nuclear status, I think having something like confidence building talks, um, which acknowledge the nuclear weapons and sort of talk about their role in North Korean military strategy, could be a very traditional way into thinking about arms control, denuclearization, um, but that is of course not going to be possible without also acknowledging that North Korea has nuclear weapons, even if it's just an implicit acknowledgement. And I think that's going to be a barrier to being able to have those kind of talks for the foreseeable future. In a way, the very fact that there have been series of talks with North Korea over its nuclear program is an, in, is an acceptance that there is something there that concerns us. So the, the next step to actually formally admit that that is the case, and the, the North Koreans do know about India and Pakistan, and they will quote that, that to you in private. Um, and they also know about Israel and uh, South Africa in the past, and they will now also say, well, I'm sure I haven't actually spoken to them recently, but um, look what happens when you give. And they they certainly said this about um, 
uh, Iran, Ir Libya, and Iraq. That uh, if you give up the means of defending yourself, look what happens: the Americans invade you, and uh, they have they will have the same argument, if you like, about Ukraine. That Ukraine had nuclear weapons on its soil; it gave them up to, with a series of international guarantees. And what happened? War between with Russia. So the North Koreans will play all these things back at us and say, well, why can't we have that sort of uh, the, the acceptance that we do have these weapons? You talk to us about them. What are you talking about if you don't accept they're there? So do you, do you expect, Jim, that the North Koreans believe that they will be, they, will, they believe that the, the world will have to talk Talk to them. We'll have to engage with them if they if they build up their nuclear nuclear w w their weapons of mass destruction. That they have a formidable capability. That they expect that this will work to their diplomatic advantage in the long term. That they would have to be engaged and eventually accepted. Do you think that is their their thinking? Yes. I think it is probably um, that. If they hang out wrong, if they hang on long enough, eventually, the reality will have to be that we accept you have nuclear weapons. Now, how can we bring you into the uh, into a controlling uh, system that uh, the, re the danger of them being used is reduced? Um, it, it, it's fine saying, oh no, we don't recognize you've got nuclear weapons, but you've still got to deal with the fact that they do have nuclear weapons and that increasingly they have the means of delivering them. And I, what worries me are, is that all, all of these tests uh, are working towards being able to deliver them accurately. I think maybe a few years back they could fire a something towards the United States without any guarantee where it would arrive. I think increasingly they can now make it actually hit a d defined target. And if that isn't worrying, worrying enough to make you sit down and want to talk with them, I don't know what is. Uh, questions? Who are the questions from the floor? So, good. We've got a, we've got a question here. Uh, how, how about here first? Hi, um, my name's Maya. I'm a postgraduate student at KCL. Um, I just have a quick question uh, surrounding the current connection between Russia and North Korea, considering the Ukrainian war. Um, we've seen an increase in the export of North Korean labor into the Russian country, and we've also recently seen North Korea officially declare that they've been exchanging military-grade weapons with Russia to help their fight. Um, how can countries like the U.S. or the U.K. now approach diplomatic negotiations with North Korea, considering it's become more intertwined within the war and now seemingly has Russia backing it in a way it hasn't previously? Okay, connection with Russia, North Korea's connection with Russia. Would either of you want to want to take that take that question? Uh, can we engage with North Korea, given that North Korea now seems to be so closely entwined with Russia? Well, we, we still have an embassy, n nominally. Uh, it's uh, not been able to function for the last three years, but I think the intention is that when the North Koreans fully open up, but we will reopen in North Korea, other countries will also reopen in North Korea. Um, and that, that will give an opportunity to raise issues that um, have hitherto not, not, been, a, not been easy to raise. Um, I, I think that, uh, sorry, I've rather lost the thread of the co question now. Um, I think that the North Koreans are great opportunist, and here was an opportunity. They were being, uh, they were being ignored by the one country that, that really concerns them. Um, and Russia has a, a need. They, they need assistance from Russia. Um, or anybody in terms of aid, um, food aid, but also infrastructure aid. Um, they have in the past obviously been close to Russia. They've had periods of alienation as well. But I think the inclination is much more towards 
being friendly with Russia than not being friendly with Russia. And the Russians now see North Korea as a possible source of small arms, ammunition, maybe rockets. Um, so opportunity makes friends. And I think that's what you're seeing. But you can probably phrase it much better than I can. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can phrase it better, but um, I was going to add one or th two things. Um, so with regards to what the US or the UK can do, um, they, they essentially face a really tricky calculus because, um, because if you want to encourage North Korea not to cooperate with Russia, then you have to provide them with incentives. Um, we heard earlier that North Korea has been under severe sanctions for a long time. Um, it is, of course, very good at evading sanctions, but at the same time, um, talking about unfreezing funds or having similar sanction relief could be one way to provide that incentive. But the question is whether um, the US or the UK see the cooperation between Russia and North Korea as significant enough in order to want to lift any part of the sanctions regime over that. Um, we've seen Russia reach out to all sorts of countries. My personal assessment is that it actually makes Russia look rather weak. You know, like obviously they're trying to evade their own sanctions and they are actually also doing a fairly good job at it. But if you look at the fact that the Russian government um, has been trying to portray superpower status on par with how the Soviet Union used to be regarded during the Cold War, um, and it is now essentially reduced to a small number of close allies, um, many of which are actually a lot less powerful and quite marginalized themselves, then um, then that's not necessarily portraying the strength that Russia probably wants to portray in that regard. So I find that quite interesting just from a diplomatic perspective. Um, I think if we are worried about Russian capabilities uh, when it comes to the invasion of Ukraine and being able to keep up pressure, um, I'm much more worried about its collaboration with Iran and the new trade route that is opening up um, that will you know, likely connect it directly to India, which will be another way to avoid sanctions. Um, so... I'm not sure, if I had to make this decision, I'm not sure that I would um, rank the relationship between Russia and North Korea as important enough um, to you know, lift or change any of the sanctions that North Korea is under just for the pressure of um, asking North Korea to back away from Russia. Maybe if it could be tied with a different ask or something like that, but then it becomes a different negotiation. So I think... Um, you know, to answer your question of what to do, I think it's something to watch, uh, to keep a close eye on, to see what exactly they are collaborating on um, and what course that collaboration takes. But um, it's not, you know, it's not the relationship that Russia has that I'm most worried about, essentially. Uh, thank you. There's a question, a question here. Uh, two, with two questions. So maybe the, 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 the lady and then the gentleman behind. If you could just say, you know, which organization you're from and your name and your organization, that would be great. Hello, my... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Yuni. I'm a PhD student at SOAS. Um, so my question is about the human rights issues. So what do you think that the South Korean government can do to resolve or help um, improve the living condition of North Koreans that is practical and effective by the South Korean government? I think, Jim, this is your question. Well, one way is to actually um, try and start talking to North Korea. Now, that's not going to be easy, of course. Um, one of the regular recommendations that from many sides is that get more information into North Korea so that the North Korean people learn more. Um, you can do this by balloons. The North Koreans threaten to shoot them down, or uh, or you could do th you can do them in other ways. I, I assume. I mean, his historically, barrels have been floated along the rivers that the, the two countries share. Um, things have been sent by balloon. They can presumably be dropped by um, from balloons, high up balloons or something. But um, it is very difficult to know. In the absence of engagement, what, if anything, the, the South Korea can do to actually influence human rights on the ground? Um, 
It's, it's true of every country that might take an interest in, in North Korean human rights. Um, if they won't talk about it, if there are no channels to talk about it, if they won't act on their obligations under um, uh, various UN um, charters, the aspects of the UN Charter on Human Rights, then what can you do? Now, back in the day when they were more open, when the world seemed um, a, a better place for them, back in the time of Kim Dae-jung or um, other periods of, let's say, the progressive um, engagement, then there, there were the possibilities of, of talking about such issues. The EU have, for a time, had a human rights dialogue with North Korea. Um, oddly enough, what killed that was the nuclear um, issue. Uh, the North Koreans withdrew because they were being um, pilloried, as they said, or attacked over the, their nuclear developments. We had um, one or two um, effects on, on North Korean human rights issues. Uh, we impressed them once when they came to London for diplomatic talks by talking not about our, their human rights problems but our own domestic human rights problems. Somebody from the Foreign Office's Human Rights Department gave a briefing on the problems we have with our police forces, with our prison services. Um, but most countries have human rights problems, which rather re reduces the moral ground on which they can criticize others. One problem with the United States is that it has, I think it's seven ambassadors for North Korea, but has never had an ambassador to North Korea. I've always thought that given that the, that the concerns in North Korea about the United States, that if the United States actually opened a liaison office, as was planned back in 1994, under the agreed framework in Pyongyang, that would have actually begun a process of dialogue in less confrontational or less dramatic situations than now you tend to have had dialogue. You'd have a regular standard means of communication. Now, um, I don't know whether it would work. It was never tried. Instead, we ended up in the offices that had been earmarked for the American delegation. But um, I, I don't see how South Korea's approach um, is going to alter the human rights situation one little bit. It, um, you do have to engage with them to raise these sort of issues. And if you don't engage, then you don't, re you don't get anywhere. It's sad, but I think it's true. Marion, do you want to add to that in response to that question? No, I unfortunately don't have anything okay. useful to say. Uh, well, just uh, on the issue of uh, hu human rights, you know, we, we, should all, we should perhaps distinguish between uh, ec economic, economic human rights and political political human rights you know on the on the economic front economic engagement will improve the the living standards of the north korean people and if we if we look at the relationship between human rights and socio economic development generally the countries which as they become more developed then human human rights uh, 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 rules a, a rule of law against them um, checks against arbitrary behavior, that also tends to advance if you look at the history of China, for example, you know, that with, with the reform and opening with economic engagement also comes uh, social change and increased expectations, higher, higher standards. And regarding North Korea, in 2019, the North Koreans proposed that to the South Korea the, the the reopening of the uh, uh, Kumgang San, the Diamond Mountain um, tourism tourism projects, and tourism was one of the areas that was actually not sanctioned, uh, not under international sanctions. So that was actually a lost opportunity. The f the in inability of South Korea to reciprocate on this North Korean proposals meant that the North Koreans actually they 
uh, they lost confidence in what South Korea could do. That they, they felt that South Korea was unable to do anything independently of the of the United of the United States, rightly or not. But that was their that was their that was their perception anyway. So I think there was a question behind behind you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nikolai. I'm a doctoral student here at uh, SUAS doing um, Korean studies. So my questions overlaps a bit with uh, the first question, so maybe uh, um, just a quick comment or you can skip it in the interest of time. Um, but anyways, I was curious about so um, the, the relations between sanctions and the um, uh, international connections that it makes North Korea um, create or enforce. So it's been mentioned that North Korea is an opportunist and with the sanctions now, there is a need to evade this, these sanctions from the North Korean perspective. And that makes um, it very um, obvious and easy to cooperate with Russia. And now that Russia is in an aggressive war against Ukraine, um, it's not a big loss for North Korea to be sort of labeled as an even worse villain um, from a Western perspective. So I'm curious um, about these sanctions. If there was less sanctions, would that give North Korea a reason to try to improve their image so that they might be able to work with, with Western countries? Or is there no real belief that even with easing these sanctions, would they still be working with countries like Russia and Iran? And um, would they still continue as a sort of world villain in, in the eyes of, of, of Western uh, perspective? Thank you. So would easing of sanctions change North Korea's behavior? Jim, Marion? Um. Jim. For a brief period, again, at the time of Kim Dae-jung, um, there, were, there were sanctions lifting, but the United States lifted a series of sanctions, and so uh, North Korea could, for example, engage in a limited fashion in the international monetary system, which is basically US-controlled. So it was possible at that point to draw money on a credit card or a debit card in, from a North Korean bank. Um, this, I think, was part of a process that, if it had continued, might have you know, brought North Korea much more out of its shell. It didn't continue because, again, it was one of those things that died with the, the Bush administration and its more hostile approach to North Korea. And the, eventually, or, or, all the concessions that had been made at that period um, between the signing, roughly between 1994 and 2001, were, were ended by the United States. I mean, sanctions have been going on for so long, and the North Koreans have become real experts at evading them. Um, but they don't evade them for what you might think, or I might think, should be the priorities. They don't invade them to get food for the vast majority of people. They get, they've, they've used them to increase their military capabilities and no doubt to provide perks for the, the elite. The fact that I was last in North Korea in 2018, just, um, and I probably will never go again. Um, but, at that point, the, the aid agencies that were still operating there, the UNDP and World Food Programme and so on, were saying that the, the sanctions that were in place and had been intensified because of the nuclear programme were having a, a clear effect on their ability to operate amongst the poorer people of the country. That material like, you could, for example, import vinyl for um, tents, for agricultural tents, but you couldn't import the metal poles to support the vinyl. And there were a whole range of things like this, apparently. So the, the fact is that while saying we want to improve uh, human rights in North Korea, all of, all of us who engage in sanctions against North Korea are actually contributing to the, de um, the deterioration of human rights in North Korea. I don't know how you get around that. Okay. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, I think there's this one here, and then there's one there's one at the back. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
thank you for your sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the nuclear denuclearization and human rights issue in North Korea. I'm a student. I'm a study abroad student at SOAS from Kyungyi University, South Korea. I'm Christine. Um, I'm very well aware my question will be very highly controversial, but um, I'm very critical about the non proliferation treaty of nuclear weapons. And why in every North Korea denuclearization discussion do we not discuss the disarmament of the NPT recognized nuclear weapon states? Isn't this such a hypocritical issue to say some states get to own such disastrous weapons while some do not, if we consider every state as sovereign? I think that's the that's the um, that's the claim the North Koreans make, isn't it? I think that's the, the the claim that the North Koreans make that the NPT and regimes like that are actually to hold back, you know, hold back uh, the weaker weaker powers of the South. But Marion, would you like to take sure. this? Sure. Um, well, I mean, uh, as you're probably well aware, the in the NPT disarmament um, is enshrined within it. So the the five recognized nuclear weapon states in the NPT aren't meant to hold on to their nuclear weapons indefinitely. They are meant to show progress, credible progress towards disarmament. Um, the NPT regime is actually under a huge amount of pressure because they have not really been doing that. Um, and um, in fact, pretty much all of them are engaging in some sort of modernization or nuclear buildup at the moment. So, um, so I think, so nuclear weapons, um, while states currently use them, as they say, to protect their own security, I don't think that in the long term they contribute to anyone's security, right? So disarmament ought to be the end goal, but getting there is incredibly difficult if there are any states at all that have nuclear weapons, which I think is basically why we ended up in the, the blockage that we're in at the moment. So... Um, I don't think that it's wrong to work towards North Korean denuclearization because I also don't think that it's wrong for other states to work towards their disarmament. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been trying for the last 90 minutes or so to discuss whether it's possible to link something as complex as human rights issues and denuclearization. And um, I think the more issues you link together in that way, the harder it becomes to make progress on all of them. So. I'm not a person who would advocate for, you know, um, abolishing the NPT or um, easing the pressure um, on any of the other nuclear possessors globally uh, when it comes to disarmament. But at the same time, I don't necessarily see what is gained from um, connecting the North Korean nuclear question to other disarmament questions. Um, if North Korea is particularly worried about the US, then maybe there could be a dialogue about what kind of US systems they're worried about, um, similarly to what the Soviet Union and the United States did during the Cold War repeatedly. But um, at the same time, that brings us back to the point we were discussing um, a few minutes ago about needing to acknowledge North Korean nuclear weapons in the first place. So um, we have these various diplomatic loops that end up blocking each other and blocking progress, which makes it uh, very difficult to figure out where to find an angle um, in order to make progress on any of these issues. And I think, um, in a way, you have to be a little agile when it comes to diplomacy. And if you see that there is an opening for talks on any of those issues, you kind of have to move quite quickly to put them together. Um, but it's going to continue to be very difficult to make progress on any of these issues, I suppose. Thanks, Jim. Uh, <coughs> If you, ask the North, if you ask the North Koreans, why have you got nuclear weapons? The instant response is, well, why have you got nuclear weapons? Um, fortunately, I never had to answer the question, uh, but um, I know the answer. Uh, it's because it makes us pe feel powerful at the time we, f we first adopted them. But I think, I'm, I'm with you, I'm afraid, I think that the NPT is a classic example of a an unequal treaty. Um, either everybody should have the damn things or nobody should have them. I would prefer nobody had them, but um, I don't think we we're ever going to get to that stage. And to pretend that some piece, people have the right to have nuclear weapons because they have certain responsibilities um, 
given what's happened in the world, it seems to me wrong. Now that's, I'm a long time out of the Foreign Office, so I, I, I'm not reflecting Foreign Office views. Okay, uh, the, the last question at the, at the back, please. Hello. Hello there. Um, my name's Heli. I'm an independent researcher. I have affiliations with SOAS and LSE. Um, I agree with the panel uh, in the way they describe the issue, but I also agree with the, um, the student who spoke just now. And I think that at an academic level, quite aside from the media discourse around the issue, we need to be developing protocols which deal with nuclear rationality across the board. It's not sufficient just to be focusing on Iran and North Korea as it is within the media. We need to be focusing on the nuclear rationality across the board. In the UK, we have a first strike rationality just like the US and just like all the states. And unfortunately, when we focus on North Korea and Iran and all the rest of it, the public gets a very distorted vision of what's actually at stake. Uh, you know, very few people know in the UK that we have the highest stockpiles of civil use plutonium in the whole world. And this is something which we never discuss within our, our mediated academic discourse. So my position would be to suggest that we need to be developing protocols for academic understanding within this whole arena. If we're to remove the world of nuclear rationality, we need to be removing the whole world in our academic understanding. Uh, Marian, would you, would you like to comment on that comment? Uh, so, in in my work, we do look at um, all nuclear possessor states and, um, yeah, essentially cover all nuclear issues. So, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that if you want to read more about various nuclear issues, um, in our publications, we cover them all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we've had a very interesting discussion. And thanks very much to our, our two pre presenters. Uh, and thank you for your questions. Uh, Please show your appreciation for the panelists. So now we've got tea and coffee outside. You, so uh, we, we restart at uh, 4, 4.05. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Nicola Leveringhouse from War Studies Department at King's, and I'm going to be moderating what I think is your last session. Um, and I'm delighted to moderate today's session on US, South Korea, Japan, minilateralism and the North Korea nuclear issue. And we've got two great speakers that complement each other very well, I think. They bring both expertise but also a rich experience with them. Uh, on my left, Professor Chris Hughes from the University of Warwick, um, a world-renowned Japan international politics expert and having worked on these issues for decades, having lived in Japan and at the University of Warwick he was also the head of department there in politics and international studies. So it's a pleasure Chris to have you here. Chris will be going first in his comments and then on my right I have um, Aidan Foston Carter um, who I think complements as I say Chris very well uh, he's an honorary senior research fellow at the University of Leeds, and he is a world-renowned career expert, having spent decades working, studying, and engaging with Korea, living there, uh, engaging with both the North and the South. So I think we're going to have a really rich panel, and I think we should get started. So, Chris, over to you. Okay. Oh, you can hear me good. Yep. Th thanks very much, uh, Nicola, for the kind... Um Introduction and again, thanks to uh, SOAS and Tatian Gong for inviting me to speak at the Korean Peninsula Peace Forum. So, um, as Nicola said, the uh, the topic that um, I was asked to talk about, and I think Aidan will also probably talk about this as well, is is um, uh, Republic of Korea, U.S. Japan, minilateralism or trilateralism, uh, and the North Korea um, nuclear issue. Um, I'm going to talk about. Um, a little bit about what the prospects for um, trilateralism are, um, particularly from the Japanese perspective in responding to the North Korean 
uh, nuclear issue, but also uh, a little bit about what some of the risks are and some of the um, problems that may be ahead on trying to um, pursue and reboot this, this minilateral, trilateral approach to dealing with North Korea. Um, so as the ambassador said at the start of his remarks uh, earlier on, Ambassador Yoon, um, there has been a really a, quite an um, amazing revival, actually, of um, ROK, Japan, US trilateralism, minilateralism, um, with the uh, Camp David Summit in, in August 2023, uh, and a variety of documents that came out of that, which have been entitled the, the Spirit of Camp David, so a joint statement and other, other related documents. Um, and they should help, potentially, the, the three countries to respond to North Korea, but also to arrange a wider Indo-Pacific issues as well. Uh, they're quite notable for not just focusing on the Korean Peninsula, but wider sets of issues um, in the region, um, including even China. Um, so all kinds of you know, really positive things in those documents, you would argue. So um, an agreement to consult on issues of common threat and joint concern. Uh, that's quite remarkable, actually. Um, that's the kind of thing that allies would normally have written into their security treaties. So quite a big, a big ambition. Um, the sharing of real-time intelligence on North Korean missile launches. Launches, and there were exercises conducted in August, um, early August of, uh, of, of 2023. Uh, trilateral military exercises. And in fact, if you, if you read the newspapers, you'll see that um, Japan... Uh, South Korea and U.S. just finished a, an aerial um, uh, exercise around their air de de defense in, um, identification zones involving U.S. B-52 bombers and Japanese and South Korean fighter planes. Uh, and also um, the promise to have annual trilateral meetings of finance, foreign, defense, national security advisors. So a plethora of, of activity. And as I said, also going wider into questions around um, supply chain security, uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework and so on. So this, these are actually, you know, when you look at it, um, if you've been following um, particularly Japan-South Korea relations uh, and really the, the difficulties in, in those relations um, and how they've related to the, to the United States, actually pretty impressive achievements because um, over the last few years, uh, you actually saw Japan and South Korea um, really at loggerheads on a range of issues, you know, threatening to sanction each other, uh, economically, uh, suspension of intelligence and um, security uh, agreements, uh, and the, the arguments over history issues and so on. So, very impressive turnaround potentially, uh, and reboot of trilateralism uh, in amongst these three countries. Um, and again, you know, people have argued for this for a long time. It's long been the wish of the United States that its two key treaty partners security treaty partners uh, in Northeast Asia should cooperate more closely with each other. Um, and, you know, again, the arguments have been very powerful to say well, they're two liberal democracies. They should have shared uh, political interests. Uh, they should work more closely together. Uh, Ambassador Yoon, uh, in his introductory remarks, again, talked about how now South Korea is talking the same language as Japan has been talking for several years around universal values and how that should help to orient um, the, the diplomatic behaviour of, 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 of these two countries. And, of course, they're also successful um, and complementary uh, market economies as well. So there's, there's, there should be huge gains, potentially, from um, um, better relationships between Japan and South Korea uh, bilaterally, but also embedded within this trilateral context of cooperation with the United States. So um, a couple of areas where I think we're, we're going to see some interesting things, potentially from the Japanese perspective... Uh, within this trilateral, minilateral framework, is certainly, uh, I think, there, are, there is the potential now to see better alignment between Japan's Korean Peninsula, and particularly its North Korea uh, diplomacy uh, and security policy with that of um, South Korea and the United States. I can go into it in more detail if you like, but over the last decade or so, I think Japan has really drifted apart from South Korea in terms of uh, its alignment with, I mean, broadly it's aligned with South Korea, but in terms of actual closer coordination in how to respond to North Korea, I mean, Japan has been involved in the sanctions effort uh, and so on and so forth. But really, Japan has been somewhat isolated in its Korean Peninsula summitry 
has been left out of that process and has been somewhat hamstrung by its own domestic problems. Uh, so potentially there's, there's, there's more uh, leeway now for Japan to re-engage and to work more closely with, with South Korea. Um, and again, you know, the, the spirit of Camp David agreements talk about how you know, the United States and Japan will support South Korea's audacious initiative uh, towards North Korea. I think very interestingly, and this is what, something I'm very, very interested in, is now we may actually see more align, uh, alignment of, uh, possibly even integration of Japanese military deterrence um, policy towards North Korea with that of not just the United States, but also now potentially uh, South Korea. As you're, I'm sure you're aware, um, the United States has operated the so-called hub and spokes uh, um, alliance system uh, in Northeast Asia. So it's had strong separate alliances with the ROK uh, and with Japan. Um, that, of course, both of those separate alliances underpin and support uh, the US presence in and around the Korean Peninsula. Um, but they are separate alliances, and in many ways, the, the coordination between them has been very, very loose uh, in, in the past. And Japan's principal role has really been to what you might call a kind of rear area support for the United States. So to defend and to watch uh, the United States back to provide logistic support so that uh, the uh, United States can project power onto the Korean Peninsula from around the Japanese archipelago. But Japan's role has been very indirect uh, and somewhat distant in terms of actual uh, engagement on the Korean Peninsula in terms of its own military capabilities and power. But if you have been um, watching the um, developments in Japan over the last year or so, you'll know that at the end of 2022, Japan released a revised national security strategy uh, a new um, national defence strategy uh, and a, a new defence build-up plan where Japan made it very clear that it would now exercise its right for what it calls, it's now calling counter-strike. So its ability, uh, if it is um, targeted by missiles uh, from North Korea or from China, uh, that it will no, no longer just try and stop those through missile defences, but it will shoot back with its own uh, very extensive build-up of cruise missiles. Uh, so really for the first time, what Japan is saying is that it will now um, not just support the United States, but it will become directly involved potentially in uh, military conflict on the Korean Peninsula if Japan's own security uh, is threatened. So this poses all kinds of really interesting questions for Japan in terms of what it will do in a Korean Peninsula contingency. Um, it's very clear now that Japan, with Counter-Strike, is going to have to coordinate its military strategy, its capabilities, with those of not just the United States, but now uh, with South Korea, in order to avoid um, inadvertently escalating uh, tensions uh, with, with North Korea, or duplicating the effort of the US ROK uh, alliance in dealing with North Korea. So. Really, the logic of this, the, the ultimate logic of this, is that Japan is going to have to, in line with US strategy in the region, talking about integrated deterrence, it is going to have to forge much closer links between its military and between that of the ROK military. And you're going to have to conjoin those two bilateral alliances potentially into one trilateral uh, alliance. So a potentially a massive shift in Japanese uh, security strategy uh, and relationship with South Korea towards the Korean Peninsula. What the impact of that will be and how that's going to uh, impact on North Korea's response uh, is um, something we're going to have to watch. Uh, the Japanese would argue it's going to enhance deterrence and therefore it will actually um, um, mean that North Korea will not provoke its neighbours. Uh, but of course there is potential for a very serious security dilemma and escalation in a future conflict. Um, I won't talk too much about some of the other, we can maybe come back to that if, if we want to, because of time I won't talk, talk too much about some of the other benefits of this trilateral co cooperation more broadly across security uh, in the region. I just want to focus a little bit on some of the risks uh, or some of the, some of the vulnerabilities of this um, uh, trilateral cooperation. So um, I've been working on Japan-North Korea relations for nearly 25, 30 years. 
Um, I'm sure Aidan may say something similar, because Aidan's also kind of veteran of, of looking at these, the, these issues. Um, we've been here before uh, in terms of trilateral cooperation uh, between um, Japan, the ROK, uh, and the United States. Um, particularly, many of us may cast our memory back to... Uh, Jim was talking about it earlier on, but the, the Cado Initiative and so on. And that was also accompanied by what was called the Trilateral Coordinate, Coordinate, Coordination and Oversight Group, TCOG, um, which you know, um, wasn't a, um, uh, an out-and-out -out security framework, but it was a diplomatic coordination framework, uh, which ran for several years but then fell by the wayside. Uh, and certainly there's a history of um, attempts to restart uh, and improve Japan ROK relations, often encouraged by the United States, in the hope that this will then feed into better trilateral coordination, but also a history of, of really um, missteps and failures and missed opportunities. Uh, and the pattern often tends to be that you see leaders from the three countries committing uh, to trying to um, really improve relations, to work more closely uh, together, but then it's often foiled uh, by divergent strategic interests uh, and a lack of domestic support or continuity in the leadership uh, in these trilateral efforts. So just quickly, a few, a few kind of, maybe they're obvious, but a few, a few risks and vulnerabilities that we need to think about in terms of uh, trilateralism or minilateralism really taking, taking hold uh, in trying to um, you know, generate a more effective framework to deal with North Korea. Um, I, still, I still think we've got a fundamental problem that there's a, there's a difference uh, in the strategic interests or calculations of South Korea and Japan towards uh, North Korea. Uh, obviously, for, so for South Korea, you know, North Korea is the prime uh, strategic interest. For Japan, it's still a secondary one. China is the, the primary interest that Japan is worried about. North Korea is a, is a big problem, uh, but it's more of a problem, a secondary security problem. It's more of a problem for Japan's uh, relationship of its alliance relationship with the United States. Uh, so um, I still think we see some divergence there, and we may see some of that um, in the future. Questions around leadership, long-term leadership. Um, again, um, uh, President Biden is very vested in this trilateral framework, but he's going to become very quickly uh, immersed in a presidential uh, campaign next year, so how much time he will have uh, to spend on this will be interesting. President Yoon, again, is very, very vested in this, but... Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert on domestic South Korean politics, but it doesn't seem to have done his domestic popularity a whole lot of good. Uh, so he may struggle to keep the momentum up. Uh, and then in Japan, Pr uh, Prime Minister Kishida, um, he, again, um, you know, he was hoping for some sort of bounce, I think, some sort of foreign policy success uh, through improving relations with South Korea through the trilateral framework. Uh, but that hasn't really happened. And he's also in quite deep domestic problems. So there may not be the, the committed leadership that we need over the longer term. Um, history is still there underneath the surface. I mean, there, have been, there has been some really good attempts to improve relations over history um, between um, Japan uh, and South Korea. Um, the latest one over the issue of um, compensation for conscripted labor. Um, I think the problem with that is that um, the view is, I think from South Korea at least, and is that South Korea has really made all the running and all the concessions here, and Japan has really just had to do very, very little. Uh, and again, there's not much appetite in for Japan for making concessions on history to, to South Korea. So um, those issues may be sort of somewhat um, um, uh, on the back burner for the time being, but they always have the capacity to come back uh, and derail um, Japan-South um, Korea relations and the bigger trilateralism, as we've seen, uh, in, in, in the past. Um, how much, should, how, uh, I think the other question a lot of people are asking themselves is if you, if you, ha you can have trilateralism, you can have lots of summits, you can have lots of meetings, you can have lots of statements, but how do you actually turn that into uh, a sustained framework? Um, do you need you know, much deeper uh, kinds of frameworks and connections? Um, you know, and is that really enough? So we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to see how much staying power the trilateralism has. Um, and then I think, you know, going back to my point about security and military connections, um, as I said, the logic is that if you really want to, you know, South Korea and Japan are going to have to work much more closely together. Um, you may have to have some kind of trilateral security relationship. But, um, you know, 
is Japan, is South Korea really ready? Are the domestic uh, constituencies of both societies really ready for actually this kind of you know, um, hard military cooperation to deal with North Korea? Um, it's going to set up all kinds of really interesting dilemmas uh, for both countries if they really want to pursue, um, as I say, the logic of the Camp David statements. Um, and the United States will be hoping that its allies don't let it down again, uh, but um, we shall see. So I think, you know, huge opportunities um, for the three countries to work together. Uh, it has to be the right thing to do, but um, I think there are also, you know, real deep vulnerabilities. You know, many of them haven't changed in that relationship, which could yet, again, you know, mean that history repeats itself and we see a derailment uh, of a promising start in, in trilateralism and minilateralism. So um, those are my remarks. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. You all deserve a medal. You know, they built this building with no windows, so you couldn't see. There is lovely autumn sunshine out there, and we're in here. It's very dedicated of you. Well done. Um, we have words, we, some of us have been doing this for a long time. This doesn't give, at least I speak for myself, this gives us no authority whatsoever. As far, If you've been working on North Korea for 55 years, as I have, all this means is you've had more chance to be more wrong in more different ways. I speak with all the authority of someone who supported North Korea for more than 10 years, no excuse for that, I was young, and who for longer than that was a very keen collapsist, a complete U-turn, that the spirit of 1989, communism seemed to be either morphing or collapsing everywhere. How could North Korea possibly survive? Doubly wrong. I may be wrong this time as well. Here's what I'm going to do. Possibly not exactly what I was asked to do, but I've always been a bit spirit of 1968 and all that. I nearly addressed you as comrades. That, how would that go down nowadays? Um, anyway, a bit about the Japan question, but really Chris has, has said it all, and I pretty much agree with him. A bit about a couple of other trilateralisms uh, involving Korea, which I think are quite interesting and timely. And also, if I may, if I could just sort of pop out some questions about the approach of the current South Korean government. We do have a short-termism problem, don't we, with both Korea and Japan. Chris has alluded to it. We have it for different reasons. South Korea, it's structural. The framers of the Sixth Republic Constitution, in their wisdom, determined that there should be no more dictators ever again, as you know, gave the president of the ROK a single five-year term. It's too short. It's too short. No chance of a second term. If this excellent annual seminar is still going in four years' time, as I trust it will be, it'll be another president. I bet it'll be a different party. It may be a different set of policies, a different ambassador telling us different things. It's a problem. There's a real issue for South Korea, I think, about bipartisanship in foreign policy. Obviously, we all have disagreements about, you know, they may not be one, and bipartisanship towards North Korea. The kind of zigzags that we've seen between the Moon administration policy, which certainly had problems, and the policy of President Yoon, it's difficult. Japan, it's different, of course, because the party can get rid of the prime minister, and they've just, they did it not long ago. Maybe they'll do it again. So that's, that's a problem built in. Not to repeat on the Japan question, except to a sadness. I think it's a minor tragedy that we're nearly 80 years after 1945, and we are where we are with Japan and South Korea. The comparison has often been made, the contrast between France and Germany. 1945 is year zero in each case. In 1945, France and Germany had fought three wars in the last 75 years. Political elites in both countries, as they rebuilt, resolved that it would be different. Obviously, a different context, the emerging EU and so on and so on. They did it. Uh, when I first went to South Korea in 1982, the anti-Japanese animus was enormous. I thought, well, it's not surprising. It's not long ago. I didn't think we'd still be here uh, 40 years after that. It's been like a game of snakes and ladders, hasn't it? And again, Chris has alluded to that. Even on the trilateralism, it's been like that, but also bilaterally between Japan and South Korea. You have the Kim Dae-jungs and others who take it forward. After all, Kim Dae-jung took refuge in Japan when he was a political exile. Um, and then it goes back again. Um, it's, it's just a shame. And so there, there is a real question in general, and in particular right now, as to whether the 
the laudable statements, the and the more than statements, it is the actual beginnings of trilateral military cooperation, which I think is, is clearly needed in the current climate, whether that is actually sustainable. And there is a problem it's been alluded to again. Um, I applaud, I have many other disagreements with President Yoon, but uh, I, his initiative on Japan, I therefore think is, I think is entirely right and timely, and I wish him luck, but he needs to take his people with him. He doesn't seem to care much about that. He's a president who only became president by a wafer-thin majority, and if the far-left Justice Party would not be so um, selfish and put a candidate up, he wouldn't even be president, because E.J. Myung... Uh, it would be president. Whether that would be better or worse is not for me to say. So really, uh, you know, there's, there's not really a mandate. And I think because, as Chris again mentioned, sadly, Japan hasn't conceded much, couldn't Japanese companies have put some money into that fund and not leave it just to South Korean companies? Anyway, for all these reasons, um, I, hope, I hope it works this time. I hope it's not just another game of snakes and ladders and that we sort of go up for a bit and we go down for a bit. Anyway... Um, there are two other interesting trilateralisms going on in Northeast Asia, are there not? One of them uh, is, we sometimes forget, I don't think it gets the publicity it deserves, the TCS, the Trilateral Cooperation, have I got that right? I may have got the initials wrong, I can't remember what the S is. Anyway, the institution building in Northeast Asia famously has not got very far, but it's got a trial secretariat, of course it is. There's a little office in Seoul, I've never been to it, I don't think it's a very big office, in which civil servants and diplomats from the three countries, Japan, China, and, and, and South Korea, presumably speak English to each other, I'm not quite sure what the working language is, go on their website, and for a moment you can think that the world is not in the terrible state that it is, because it's all full of all the lovely things they could do together. At a more important, and that's not unimportant, but at a more important elite level, of course, there have been summits at various times. Uh, then, because of various rows between the three, they haven't been held for a while. Very interesting question is whether, as South Korea is due to host the next one, will it actually come off? Might Xi Jinping even come to Seoul? He wouldn't come for Moon Jae-in, who was desperate to have him come. Will he come for Yoon? Maybe uh, he'll send the number two, as usual. But um, I do think, I'm, I'm glad that kind of trilateralism exists as well, for all sorts of reasons. One, because Japan, China, and Korea have, do I have to say it? I don't have to spell it out, do I? Especially not at SOAS. Huge historical, geographical, cultural histories. And now they are three of the mightiest economies in the world, and they are very heavily mutually involved with each other. Um, that's becoming a bit awkward for some purposes. But I'm, in a time when we often seem to be in a rather polarizing world and a rather polarizing region, um, I am glad of this forum, and I hope that it will, it will survive the tendencies to, the, to, uh, to polarization. I'm going to not quite do the other triangle yet because I want it, because it actually is a happy ending and we don't have a lot of happy endings nowadays do we so I'm going to sort of break up my own order and very quickly throw out some questions for the current South Korean government and its approach in no particular order Ah, some slightly worrying things. We hear talk in Seoul that may, from the new defense minister, for example, that maybe they should ditch the 2018 inter-Korean military accord. It hampers intelligence gathering. I don't want South Korea to be the Korea that breaks agreements, please. Shall we leave that to North Korea? Secondly, is it... I don't know whether President Yoon really meant it at the time of the drone... Remember the drone incursion, which was very embarrassing. It wasn't very threatening, but it was very embarrassing. Threatening next time threefold retaliation, tenfold retaliation. Please tell me that was just rhetoric, because I don't think... I'm not a military expert, but I don't think that escalation would be a good idea. Thirdly, the whole unification question. Um, unification under liberal democracy, it's been said in the previous session, if you're wanting unification under liberal democracy, and I, I would want it in the abstract, you're telling North Korea that it shouldn't exist and it can't exist. There's no two ways about it. If you're serious about that, then as far as I can see, the audacious offer is baloney. I'm sorry, but you know, you can't, the audacious offer is also, of course, rehashed Park Geun-hye, the Dresden Declaration. We know that the North Koreans won't accept it, but that's a different point. But the point is, if you really, the only unification that you really foresee is under liberal democracy, then 
you know, the audacious, and the North Koreans know perfectly well that, 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 that you're not serious about the other. I don't think you can have it both ways. Or if you appoint as a unification minister a figure who I think would not have been considered any, under any past regime, including conservative ones, as a serious candidate for unification minister, somebody who has called openly for, for the overthrow of the DPRK. <laughs> I mean, the, North Korea it does take some notice of these things. So what signal does that send? Um, going a little bit deeper, um, what signal does it send also domestically when you put on trial senior figures of the previous ROK administration for operational decisions that they took in two very tough, difficult situations, the guy who floated to North Korea and the fisherman who was sent back? Um, we could argue forever about these things, but putting people on trial for that prosecuting them, persecuting them, perhaps? I'm not, I'm not sure that that's such a great thing. So anyway, those questions. And now I'm coming back to my happy ending and the other triangle. That's the one we've been hearing so much about recently because of the Kim and Putin show. Shall we call it that? Because I think it was a show, basically. Um, now, the, so the, for the full scary version, there's a new paper from the Rand Corporation, a trilateral imperialist alliance. You've got Russia, which indeed certainly is viciously invading Ukraine. You've got China, which has its eyes on Taiwan. And you've got Kim Jong-un, who, who can't wait to get his hands on all those goodies in South Korea. Um, I don't see this. For a start, I'm a sociologist, and a famous sociologist called Zimmel told us that a dyad and a triad are different. A two and a three are different. Can we assume that these three are really... I mean, there is a very opportunistic alliance of convenience. They have, to, they have certain strategic things in common right now. But the, if you look at the different components of it, the Russia-North Korea relationship has been terrible for a long time. And it's been insubstantial for a long time. It'd be very interesting to see what actually does come of this now. Whatever weapons North Korea is sending, I, I'm not a weapons expert, but I don't know anybody who thinks they will be a game changer in Ukraine. I don't for one moment think that the quid pro quo from Putin is going to be anything that helps the WMD programs. I mean, he's not, he's not that, you know, you may think he's evil, but he's not that crazy. Uh, it is not completely meaningless or insignificant that until 2017, China and Russia supported all those resolutions against the various North Korean WMD in the EU. And they don't want, you know, a, a burgeoning nuclear uh, North Korea. Well, they, they've actually got one. And if, if I can just interpolate a thought on this, I mean, as, when we were talking about the deterrence of why North Korea has nuclear weapons in America, America, America. I think that one reason why Putin has got nuclear weapons is also to deter China and Russia. Because look at his foreign policy. I don't think this has been noticed enough, or else I'm completely mad. I told you I've been wrong twice before. He, what would his father and grandfather think? What has happened to Juche? What has happened to North Korea being independent in the world, balancing between China and Russia, or balancing between China and South Korea with Kim Jong-un? He's cuddling up to both of them. And he can, he can do, he needs the money, he needs the protection, and he could do that because he's got nuclear weapons. What are the implications for South Korea? South Koreans here, you can sleep very easy in your beds, and I'll tell you why, even though North Korea has got all sorts of weapons which we wish it didn't have, which are rapidly advancing under Kim Jong-un. Because institutional memory in dictatorships like China and, and Russia is quite good. They haven't forgotten 1950. They haven't forgotten when Kim Jong-un's grandfather embroiled both of them in a war which was terrible for both of them. It was absolutely, you know, Mao had just won. Did he want to send more troops to Korea? Russia wasn't officially there, but we know all the support. They have other fish to fry. They, it's a tactical alliance of convenience. Um, but as far as the peninsula is concerned, this, I would like to hear from the audience if there is someone who thinks that Kim Jong-un will feel emboldened by this superpower support to try anything in South Korea. I don't think so. China and Russia have other strategic interests. They also have quite strong commercial relationships with South Korea, which are not negligible at all. So as far as that you know, imperialist alliance, uh, aggressive alliance, I think that South Koreans should actually be glad that Kim Jong-un is cuddling up to Russia and China. And I think that's probably quite enough provocation for one afternoon. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to abuse my position as moderator to um, ask a question and then I'll open it out to the floor. I understand we have until 15 past, um, so that's just slightly over 30 minutes. Um, so I think you both did a really good job of highlighting, I think, the domestic politics angle, the historical rivalry, um, the role of US leadership, um, and how all those things factor in. Um, and I think you've both clearly made it clear that you've been here before, to use Chris's term. Um, and I, I get a sense um, and expectations are quite low <laughs> from both of you. Um, but I guess I want to push on what's different now. Um, one of the things that, unless I misheard you, one of the things that wasn't mentioned was AUKUS. Um, and, um, of course, the fact that the the material side of things is different, right? I mean, capabilities-wise, uh, not just the peninsula, but Northeast Asia in general as a, re as a region, is armed up to the teeth, right, in ways it has never been before. Um, China, North Korea, South Korea, even Japan's defence, um, changes to its defence. Australia, of course, has made massive changes to its defence policy in recent years. So I think that's definitely that something is new. Um, and AUKUS, if it is sustainable, and Australia has made a massive gamble to make it a success, how would that change um, Northeast Asia? Particularly because um, you know there's been a lot of rumbling about South Korea maybe joining um, AUKUS, at least Pillar 2, which is more about emerging technologies and so forth. Of course, South Korea wants its own nuclear-powered um, submarines as well. So I guess that's my question, is I get a sense, based on your years of experience and expertise, that your expectations are perhaps low, but what's new here for you both? Thanks, Nicola. Great, great question. Um, what's new from the Japanese perspective? Um, and I guess, you know, what, what would make this stick, I suppose? You know, what would make Japan hang in there regardless of some of the bumpiness in, in bilateral relations with South Korea because it's in its bigger strategic interests? Um, so I think what's new? So I think, there, I think largely the kinds of things that you've alighted upon um, from the Japanese perspective... Um, and again, you know, I'd, I'd encourage everyone, if you've not had a chance, read the, read the National uh, Security Strategy, revise one in 2022, and compare it with the 2013 Japanese National Security Strategy. Um, so from the Japanese perspective, um, and what is made very clear in that, in that document, um, and in all Japanese rhetoric around it, and you know, policy development since then, is that the Japanese, uh, they're arguing this, and I think they sincerely believe this, is that the international system is now in deep, deep crisis. Um, the status quo um, may not hold. Um, China, the Japanese have been worried about China for a long time. Um, they've convinced it's no longer, a, it, it's not a status quo power, and they believe that it's actually beginning to seriously you know, move on trying to upset the status quo. The war in Ukraine, um, and again, you know, why the Japanese suddenly suddenly have discovered that you know Russia's a revisionist power is ridiculous. I mean, you know, Abe Abe spent years trying to negotiate with with Putin, believing he could engage Russia and he'd get some concessions on Northern Territories issue and a peace treaty and all these kinds of things. But now they've they, you know now they say, oh yes, okay, yeah, yeah, Russia, um, you know, is is also you know deeply revisionist power, um, and that again is you know, has upset the entire international order that's that's the kind of language they're using uh, it's the deepest crisis in international order the deepest security challenges that japan has faced since world war ii so that's the kind of language that they're, they're using and then north korea again you know we talk about japan and north korea as i said north korea has always been a secondary issue an irritant but you know it's just one more thing uh, which you know and again you know putin teaming up with north korea and so on it's just another example that the international order is, is, a fundamental th is a, under fundamental threat. And then, of course, the thing that really um, the Japanese see as decisive is the retreat of US power. So um, they've always known, you know, they've, they've known for 20, 30 years that even as US power has waxed and waned, you know, the, the, rel the, the trajectory has been a sort of a relative decline uh, in US hegemonic power. 
But now I think they believe that US is really, again, um, uh, on the brink, perhaps, of losing its hegemonic status in, in East Asia as it's pushed out by China you know, and, and so on and so forth. So, so the Japanese believe that they have, to, they have to intervene. They have to shore up US hegemony. Uh, and they have to work much closer with um, US strategy. And that means working much more closely with US allies, you know, like Australia, like South Korea, um, you know, the UK, um, partners like India and so on. So I think, I think that is a, a massively important driver uh, for Japanese perceptions now, is that um, in the past I think they thought, well, you know, maybe we can sort of, um, you know, the US will come in and save our bacon in the end, you know, um, but now I think they believe that if we, if if, if Japan does not front up, uh, it does not is not seen as a reliable ally, uh, is not capable of taking more responsibility for its own defence, is not capable of working as an integrated alliance partner with the United States and with other U.S. allies and partners. Japan will be abandoned, and it will be left alone. Uh, so you know, we really have to make the best of this relationship with with the ROK, and I think that has been a a kind of a sea change. In, in Japanese thinking. So I think that has convinced many conservatives in Japan. I think they've always wanted a better relationship with South Korea, but actually now we really have to come good. Um, you know, again, whether that's going to be enough, I don't know, but I think it is quite different from the past where, you know, perhaps Japan could sort of, you know, dilly, sort of have a dalliance with this relationship with our, the ROK, but if it didn't work, it's fine, you know. The US will, say, will come and save us, but now uh, really the chips are down and this is where Japan really has to really has to, um, you know, come good. I'm glad you asked that question, because there's always the risk of you doing stuff for a long time. You emphasize continuity more than change. It's a very different world in lots of ways. The bacon-saving question, if I can put it like that, picking up Chris's metaphor, of course, very much arises for South Korea as well. It's, uh, I suppose, for all US allies, given not just sort of retreat of US power, but again, conjunctural factors, as I would have said in my Marxist days, if you can call Trump a conjunctural factor. What if that man comes back again with his utter contempt for all, an uh, open contempt for all US allies? Um, so, yes, the question of S South Korea going nuclear, never forget that Park Chung-hee had a program to do that secretly until the Americans found out and stopped him. That was the first Korea to try to go nuclear. Um, there is, there is obviously enormous concern. I agree with Chris that this is a factor, and in that sense, and only that sense, I'm glad of it, driving, you know, sort of knocking heads together, if you like, sort of the people in Seoul and Tokyo realizing they should talk to each other. Other changes, I didn't mean to make light of Kim Jong-un's arms built up. I, I worry that I might, might have seemed to. It's a huge difference. For a long, remember the time, there was a long period when even when North Korea had begun down the nuclear road and had begun its nuclear tests, which reminds me, we're still waiting for that seventh one, aren't we? No doubt we'll have it sooner or later. Um, we thought, oh, well, they can't deliver it, there's no, because the missiles failed quite often. I mean, so ma massive sea change of capacity uh, to deliver under Kim Jong-un, that is a big difference. And yeah, everyone, as Nicola put it very well, every, everyone is armed to the teeth now in ways that just weren't the case. T chucking in somewhere, though maybe it's more of a global thing, that South Korea's emergence as, as a major arms exporter. And you've probably seen one of the suggestions, sort of the, the various motives of the Kim Putin show, was um, what Putin thought about um, the huge defense contracts that South Korea signed with Poland. I mean, in some ways, so, you know, Yoon, for all his talk about universal human rights, has continued to navigate with some care around the Russia and the China questions, different questions, of course. Yes, he has been to Kiev and so on. He's still not supplying uh, arms. I think I'm right in saying South Korea is still not supplying arms directly to Ukraine. And UK, different sort of issue, not a war issue, but again, the huge US pressures uh, to on the chip issue and others. I mean, South Korea has stood up to those quite well. But anyway, so that's, that's different from the, the arms exporting issue. I mean, what, what a time to be a global, an arms salesman to Saudi Arabia with the Middle East and the state it is. But I don't mean to say be hypocritical and where everybody does it. You know, South Korea is just joining a, an industry, the demand for which is, is, is never probably going to abate. So yes, there are a lot of different, and the, the uncertainty, I, I, still, I worry more about 
Uh, I worry a lot about Trump coming back. Some American analysts please tell me that I have nothing to worry about. <laughs> and the impact on the region. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, I just have a quick response, but I do want to open it out to the floor. I'm not sure how the question and answers were conducted in the previous sessions, but just just, you know, put your hand up when when you have a question. I think I think it's, you know, material capabilities aside on the military fund. Um, I'd be quite interested to hear more about um, the economic um, side of this as well, the economic coercive capabilities. The sad incident um, in, in South Korea and how that affected so very badly um, the relationship with China and how much that had an impact in, in, in sort of this thinking of we need to diversify and deepen our relationship. And, and related to that, I think, is that in general, it's become harder to deter and harder to do diplomacy um, in the region, given these changes. Okay, I'm going to open the floor. So I'm, I'm scanning the room for um, arms, uh, arms up. Yes, please. Um, hello, I am a first year student at SOAS. My name is Noah. So I personally am very concerned about the increasing tendency or even reliance towards military power in the trilateral relationship. So South Korea, Japan and the States. Is this the consequence of the stagnant process or rising urgency or something else? And is there any other um, possible approaches, hopefully something that looks more like a soft power? Any other, we can group them together, any other questions? Yes, please, at the back. Hello, my name is Ryosuke. I study international relations at UCL. I'm first year as well. Um, I was wondering how Taiwan factored into all of this. I've heard some analysis about how uh, Korea contingency could be a sort of diversion when China does its own contingency in Taiwan. So I was wondering how much of a possibility that sort of scenario was. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more question. It's in the middle there, yeah. Hi, my name is Sam. I study at UCL. I'm wondering um, what the whether whether the repeal of Article Nine of the Japanese Constitution is a realistic possibility because there I've heard rumblings about it in some American media outlets, and how South Korea would respond to such an uh, development. All good questions, some of them, I think, beyond my pay grade, which is my fault. Um, Nicholas' comment about economic coercion and THAAD, that was really important. Um, I think that, uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, but I'm sure you all do, that uh, when the Park Geun-hye administration installed this particular US uh, missile defense system, China was very cross about it because China says, and I believe this is technically true, but I'm not a, an expert, that it can also en enable that uh, you can sort of see what China is up to as well. And they reacted in a way which was really rather unsubtle, although they never admitted it, much less apologized. There were major boycotts, selective boycotts, of the China-South yeah, uh, Korea economic relationship, um, tourism in particular, and so on. Um, this performed a wonderful service, in my view, of disabusing the South Korean public of some of their illusions about, about China. I think there had been, you know, the, the, some of the enthusiasm of the restoration of diplomatic relations 30 years ago, and the, uh, China was seen quite positively, and you know, if China's being positive, see it positively, but it's like the whole wolf warrior diplomacy, which puzzles me so much, because subtle it ain't, is it? It's just China saying, you know, it's not even trying soft power, it's just saying, we are big, you will obey. And so you now get public opinion surveys in South Korea, which suggest that China is disliked and distrusted even more than Japan. So I think that was probably a plus. On the, um, 
the second question, I, I'm not aware that the Japan-US uh, South Korea cooperation is purely military. Certainly as far as the bilateral Japan-South Korea end is, I mean, I'm, I am hoping that an improved relationship would also involve more people studying each other's languages, more exchanges, all of that. I don't think these are exclusive. The trouble is, in each case, it needs a sustained effort by governments and by leaders who may not be um, in power for, for very long. Um, on the Taiwan question, I don't feel I have the proper expertise, but there's always been sort of complications about how we talk about the forced dispositions and how everybody knows uh, things really are. I mean, I know it's been a concern in South Korea for some time that uh, 28,500 US troops are not just there to uh, to guard against a potential North Korean invasion. I think Donald Rumsfeld, remember him, known unknowns, uh, said it openly, you know, that uh, and sort of let the cat out of the bag that obviously if there were a contingency in the Taiwan Strait, some of those would go somewhere else and so on. Um, in terms of the politics of it, um, it's much more complicated, isn't it? I don't, I mean, you may think me complacent about this, but I'll reiterate what I ended with. I don't think anyone is going to try anything on the Korean Peninsula. I wish I could be so confident that nothing is going to happen in Taiwan either. Uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, so, as, I, as Aidan said, I, I, don't, I don't think the, the trilateral is, is, is all about military, military power. Um, again, if you read the, the statement, it says just all, the, all the things that... Um, he talked about this kind of you know, soft power, this societal to societal exchanges. So, so it is trying to sort of try and build a little bit more from bottom up, uh, a kind of more robust set of relationships between Japan and um, South Korea and, and the United States. Um, and there is more. There is a certain amount in there around you know economics and so on. Um, I think the problem is that. Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert on U.S. foreign policy, but I think a lot of people would say that the U.S. is is a little bit short on what it can offer economically at the moment. So, um, because it's um, because it's reluctant to do trade deals, it only has the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is again around sort of supply chains and digital transactions. It's all very very important, but it doesn't have many material incentives to offer partners at the moment in terms of trade. So um, perhaps it's somewhat left the field to to others to um, to be more influential in that. So it's a soft power, but certainly sort of non-military side of things. Um, Taiwan, again, it's very interesting that I think the, um, if I recall the, um, um, again, the, the Camp David statements do actually refer to Taiwan. Uh, again, you know, it's a kind of, it's a familiar trope around, you know, um, um, all sides, you know, want, want to see peace and stability and um, status quo across, across straits and so on. But I think that might have been the first time that, um, you know, traditionally I think South Korea has been quite reluctant to actually talk about, you know, because of its concerns about China, to explicitly talk about um, Taiwan, um, uh, but it's in there. Uh, so again, I think it's, it, it is a sort of portent of potentially greater, certainly US expectations for greater cooperation um, diplomatically and perhaps in, in sort of military terms uh, around Taiwan. How, how much RIK is willing to do that, I don't know. But as, as Aidan said, you know, um, US forces in, in, in the ROK are designed, you know, primarily for the, for the deterrence of North Korea, but, you know, things like the US Marines and so on and uh, um, you know, Air Force and so on. Of course, they would also be potentially involved in a, a Taiwan Straits contingency. Question on Article 9. Um, uh, will Article 9 be re revised? Uh, I think probably unlikely. Um, Prime Minister Abe, you know, um, in the sort of last couple of years of his administration, uh, was pushing very hard to, to um, revise Article 9 because for him, symbolically, it was very, very important as a, as a statement of Japan... Um, escaping, freeing itself from the, the constraints of the, the, the post-war settlement, um, of which, you know, Article 9 was part of this kind of foreign-imposed constitution, um, which meant Japan couldn't really be Japan. So, um, you know, he, he wanted to push for that, but he found it domestically really, really difficult to do because of the, um, you know, the majorities you need in both both houses of, of, of the Diet, but also you need a, pu a public... Um, referendum as well, so very, very difficult. But I always say it just doesn't really matter, actually. Article 9 is, is really symbolic. Um, you know, Japanese conservatives would like to get rid of it as, as a statement, but in effect, they've already got rid of most of the constraints on Japan's ability to use 
uh, military power um, through reinterpretation of Article 9 and um, you know, 2015, 2014, 2015, uh, Japan um, reinterpreted the Constitution in all kinds of very clever ways um, to be able to exercise the right of collective self-defence, so to now come to the assistance of the United States in certain contingencies um, that affect Japan's own security. So, in a sense, that was, a mo that was the most important political battle that Abe, Abe fought. So, Article 9, yes, Conservatives would love to get rid of it, but I think they, they probably think it's, it's just too difficult to do. But substantially, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, Japan can do just about everything it wants to do under through, through reinterpretation. Okay, any more questions? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Fosse Year, um, the PhD student from City University of London. I actually have a question, the continued continuity from the Article 9 uh, to Christopher. Okay, if Japan uh, has a, that kind of perspective, what do you think is about Korean government perspective? Thank you. So I think I think the question is what maybe I should have answered that in, in resp at the end of the last question as well. So uh, what what what's I guess um, what 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 is the what is the South Korean government thinking about you know Japan's discussions around constitution revision and and you know not just revision but reinterpretation. Uh, so um, uh, I guess it's going to depend somewhat from administration to administration, but I think the traditional stance of um, that you get from South Korean governments is that you know Japan must be cautious, uh, must remember you know uh, obviously the, its history, um, and you know um, would prefer that Japan did not uh, revise or reinterpret Article Nine. But um, nevertheless, I think you know increasingly, um, uh, whilst um, South Korean policymakers do not want to see, um, I don't think they want. To, and again, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, they're not. They have no expectations, that, you know, that, or, or, or wish for Japan to come to the military assistance of South Korea. I think they do recognise that um, um, the United States' expectation is that Japan will come to the military assistance of the United States, uh, and unless the United States is assisted by Japan, then um, you know it, the U.S. ability to assist South Korea becomes hampered. Uh, so I think they probably implicitly uh, accept that you know this is something that Japan needs to do. Uh, in order to um, you know, maintain its alliance relationship with the United States, whilst, of course, they would like Japan, for obvious reasons, to be um, um, as cautious uh, and as limited as possible in terms of what it will do uh, you know, with, with revisions under Article 9. But I think probably there's an acceptance that you know, Japan has to do this. Otherwise, um, again, no US-Japan alliance, and then the whole alliance system, US-Japan, the whole US alliance system in Northeast Asia starts to come apart at the seams. Um, so probably an implicit you know, acceptance that this, this is something that pragmatically Japan has to do, but has to be cautious. It brought to mind something from long ago. I believe it's true, Jim perhaps can confirm, that back in the day of the Korean War, when probably America didn't quite know about relations between Japan and Korea, and there was sort of vague talk, oh, well, Japan will help. Syngman Rhee, East Sung Man, said that if a single Japanese person lands in, soldier lands in Korea, he will immediately turn his forces around from fighting North Korea to fighting Japan. Those days are no longer with us, but I think the answer to your question is it really, it does depend who is in power in South Korea at any given time. As far as I can see, um, Yoon, Yoon so kyol is so keen to achieve um, a rapprochement with Japan, that he Japan can can do almost anything. But as I said before, I worry that he isn't taking South Korean public opinion with him. At the centre, I mean, from here, I'm not close enough to the action, I think, anymore. But um, the, the whole, you know, the, all the narratives, all the the very real suffering, never to be denied, of comfort women, slave labourers, etc., which the the opposition, the Democrat Party, makes much of. I don't know how, people here can probably answer it, how, how that all plays with young South Koreans particularly. I, I get the impression that maybe 
it's going down a bit. But this is political work that needs to be done if you want to get policy continuity. Otherwise, uh, if, if Japan can just do what it wishes, um, then, and South Korea seems not to be um, responding, you know, sort of responding to it, then I think there's a real risk that it may, go, uh, uh, that it may not go through. And that reminds me, sorry, something I forgot to say early on. There is a precedent, as they know well in Japan, for South Korean leaders who began with wanting a rapprochement and then uh, sort of did a U-turn, Im Young Bak, born in Japan, uh, keen to rapprochement, and then, my God, he helicopters onto Dokto. <laughs> you know, it was a blatant attempt. So, uh, you know, Yoon Sok Yol is unpopular. His party just got a real thrashing, which they deserved, in a by election. They have, as you know, a National Assembly elections coming up. The opposition already has a huge majority, which I don't think is going to get smaller, it might get bigger. Um, what if Yoon's party pressures him, says, you know, Mr. President, you're going too fast for the public on this? He's so stubborn that I think actually he will hold on. And in this issue, if, if no other, I'm glad of that. But it's, he's, not, he's, not a, he's not a politician, is he? We know this. He's a prosecutor. He, he's not preparing the ground. Anyway, we shall see. On this, I wish him well. Okay, thank you both. And we have a few more minutes left. So any last questions? Oh, we've got two. Okay. <coughs> Um, my name is Ola Tsunde. I studied um, calculus on the maths program at Barbeck University. Uh, my question is that I want to refer to um, one previous statement by the former chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, um, Chairman Alan Greenspan, that when he said that in order for the world to be saved from an economic crisis, there has there's need for increased international trade. So, do you then think that if there's that increase in economic activities within those countries, that will promote peace in the region? Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we can take the, the last question. Hi, I'm a master student at SOAS. My question was, since we've discussed the ROK, US, Japan trilateralism, and we've also touched upon AUKUS, I wanted your opinion about the potential of ROK being a part of the Quad, both from ROK, the merits of it, both from Korea's point of view and also from the Quad's point of view, especially Japan, since it was something very close to Prime Minister Abe's heart. Um, yeah, th thanks for the questions. Um, so the first one, yeah, I mean, um, trade, economic interdependence, I mean, I think, you know, um, those are kind of classic um, kind of liberal views of, of, of international relations. And um, I think, you know, from the Japanese perspective, they've long subscribed to that view that um, their, hope, their, their hope has always been that, um, you know, economic interdependence ultimately will win out over what we call more narrow security or domestic domestic interests, whether it's a relationship with South Korea, you know, uh, uh, or United States or China, um, and you know, in the past, um, Japanese used to talk about separation of politics and economics. So you could you could separate the two. Um, you know, with China, they used to talk about sort of um, cold politics, hot economics. So you know, again. Um, you know, the economy would run well um, and, you know, politics would be difficult, but ultimately, you know, uh, Chinese pragmatic economic interests would, would win out. And I think they still largely believe that, but I think increasingly in Japanese minds, um, I think they are believing that actually, um, you know, their real concern is that particularly with China, uh, is that, that that economic independence is now um, turning into an economic asymmetry. Uh, and that China is prepared to use that as leverage over, over Japan and its neighbours, uh, and that actually, um, you know, um, economic independence is not going to be the solution uh, for peace and security in the region. And in fact, you know, again, you know, Japan has to turn reluctantly to, you know, um, military deterrence as well alongside uh, economic engagement. So, um, you know, I think that's where, you know, Japanese are becoming more and more, you know, kind of harder... Harder realists. Um, the Quad, yeah, um, that's very interesting. Um, certainly, um, 
you know, when Japan first came out with the idea of the quad, uh, sort of 20, two, that was Abe, two, sort of 2007, uh, South Korea actually worked quite actively to block it. Um, so that, you know, again, it sort of upset, upset the Japanese. Um, and then Japan sort of, when it revived the quad, when Abe came back in his second administration, he revived the idea of the quad. He didn't talk, he didn't talk about, you know, ROK as a potential well, quad, you know, so it wasn't the quid or the, the quin, whatever. Um, it was, you know, he, he deliberately left out the ROK because relations weren't, weren't great, even though, you know, ROK is a, a democracy alongside Australia, India, and, and the United States. So, um, but I think actually the Japanese have started to come around to the, to the idea that, um, you know, having, having the ROK in would be, would be, would be really beneficial, uh, again, because of the change of, of, of relationships between, between the, two, the two countries, and also particularly because um, the ROK has begun to, to shift its, its view on China, I think. Um, I mean, of course, you know, the, the, those in the Quad would argue the Quad is not about China, but of course we know it is kind of about China. Um, so, um, you know, and the ROK traditionally was standing aside from um, trying to label China as a, as a concern. Uh, and again, that goes back to my point about sort of differing strategic interests between, uh, you know, uh, ROK and, and Japan when it comes to China. But now, now that the Yun administration is, is being much more forthright on China, and again, you can see that in the Camp David statements, we're actually talking about China and South China Sea, you know, explicitly for the first time. Um, you know, I think the Japanese are thinking, yes, you know, um, ROK would be a good um, um, uh, partner in something like a, a kind of expanded quad. So um, there's, there, is, there is potential for much closer strategic alignment now. I think we found something we might slightly disagree on. <laughs> I would say that uh, China is, uh, sorry, that South Korea is slightly more forthright about China under Yoon. They're still very careful I mean, all this universal human rights stuff, do we hear Yun saying anything about the Uyghurs? I mean, he's not the only one, or the Tibetans. Dalai Lama still can't even transit through Seoul. Um, you know, it, they've, and not saying that it's wrong necessarily, because there are huge economic interests in that. I mean, I say the, um, the, the way the whole chip thing has just been very successfully lobbied about, so that actually... You, you probably know this fact about the interconnectedness of the world economy, so in a way this brings in the, the earlier question as well. There are some bits of interdependency that just can't be undone. I, I'm kind of, well, I'm kind of glad in some, some way. Um, the, the, two, the two largest makers of memory chips, both kinds in the world, are South Korean, and for both, they're Samsung and SK Hynix. It's funny, no one in the world has heard of SK Hynix, have they? Everyone's heard of Samsung. No one's, all the Koreans have heard of SK Hynix. No one else. Anyway, they are, it's the, it's the number two chaebol as well now, not as well as number two for chips. And to, f both, for both of them, production in China is, is key. Samsung is the largest NAND uh, chip factory in the world in, in Xi'an. Terracotta Army and Nan Chips, I like the juxtaposition. You can't, I mean, these are brutal facts of geoeconomic life that you cannot, that you cannot change. And so Yoon is, is he will, he, he, on the Japan front, you know, all systems go. He's very keen. On the China front, he will still tread carefully. I would be surprised if, China, if, if um, South Korea was ever formally to join the quad. It will align itself. There will be, I don't know enough about how the quad works. I remember there will be working groups and there was talk of alignments slightly even under Moon Jae-in who was, who was more cautious again. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think. Okay, well, thank you very much. Both of you have covered a lot of ground, a lot of questions, I thought, as well in the panel. Um, I think you've both highlighted uh, the positive trend, the fact that they're, they're all talking to each other more but also the, the many risks and the, the difficulties that have grown right, um, in, in, in the region. You've covered a lot of issues, China, uh, Taiwan, the war in Ukraine, AUKUS, Quad, economic independence, domestic issues. So I applaud you both. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a fascinating um, end to um, the Peace Forum today. Thank you very much. Okay, um, right, thank you very much. Uh, all the uh, thanks to all of the um, panellists and the moderators and the audience. It just leaves me to make some 
you know, some concluding remarks. Well, well, first of all, I'm, I'm relieved that there was no fire alarm today. There have been so many, there have been so many fire alarms. You know, I've been getting nightmares. What if there's a fire? What if there's a fire alarm? You know, it will put us out. You know, we can enjoy the autumn sunshine, but it would have ruined the event. Um, so, just some uh, some final points wrapping up from the two from the two sessions. You know, the 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 first session. Uh, some some takeaway points. We saw that North Korea was um, uh, North Korea's concern with in building up its uh, nuclear weapons is actually with deterring the United States. So this means a massive buildup of nuclear weapons. But it also has a belief that it, by building up its nuclear capabilities, that eventually it cannot be ignored and it will have to be engaged and eventually integrated into the international community. And also, we, we dealt with the, the question of, um, you know, whether to engage with North Korea or to call it out over its human rights ab abuses. This remains a very, very contentious issue, this, this strategy. And also, I think something we could all, all agree with is that the, um, the, the reunification formula proposed by the two Koreas need to be acceptable to both, to both sides. That, uh, rather than talking across each other, and the second uh, the second session dealing with triangular relationships, the 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 the, the Camp David ag agreement, uh, strengthening the potential for the the deepening of cooperation between the the three the three allies, the potential for the extension of the Indo-Pacific free and open Indo-Pacific into the uh, into North Northeast Asia, but we saw that the, the, this can be um, that there's potential for closer, much closer military cooperation, especially between Korea and Japan, but this can be endangered by political uh, short-termism. Uh, whether President Yoon can bring the South Korean public along with him, the the short-term nature of the South Korean political political system, and uh, you know the return of Donald Donald Trump, you know who doesn't have have much time for allies or for institutions. Um, uh, also, we looked at the other, the other triangular, uh, the other triangular um, re relationship: China, Russia, North Korea, and that this is actually not as me menacing as it su superficially looks. That there are actually a lot of strategic mismatches between the three, the three parties, and uh, historically, even when the relationship was at its closest in the nineteen in the 1950s, actually the relationship was characterized by uh, suspicion and friction, even at the best of times in the 19, 1950s. So, it, so, so th this relationship is actually much more fraught than the, uh, uh, than the ROK, Japan, United States relationship. Uh, as Aidan said, North Korean nuclear weapons is, is not just to counterbalance United States and South Korea, but also China and China and Russia as well. So to what extent would they want to enhance the North Korean nuclear capabilities? And, and also there is also the China, South Korea, Japan economic interdependence, which is actually very, 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 very deep. Uh, for example, in making, making the, memory, the, the memory chips South Korea makes a lot of the chips, but it depends upon chemicals imported from Japan. But it also needs the import of uh, rare earth metals from China. So the, 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 the geoeconomics are very, very deeply embedded. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, whether this uh, deep economic interdependence, you know, is something that can uh, offset the uh, political polarization and the military tension in the region. And, um, well, last, last of all, I'd like to thank the Embassy of the Republic of Korea for initiating and supporting this event, and to, to thank the, uh, the SOAS conference office, uh, Hannah, Angelica, uh, thank the marketing office and the, uh, the student, the two student ambassadors, uh, also to, to thank uh, the AV department, uh, Je uh, Jerry, who's, who's up there, just gave me a thumbs up. Um, so we hope you enjoy the, the event. Uh, please fill out the surveys if you can, and uh, you are welcome to take a, take a souvenir with you. So thanks very much. See, see you next year. <laughs>